Okay. Um, well, first of all, thanks, thanks so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to see so many people, so many people here. Um, I'll start off, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. So I'm a, an entomologist at the University of Edinburgh. I just finished my PhD last year. Um, so my, my real passion is Lepidoptera, and I've worked on a range of different aspects of Lepidoptera. So uh, taxonomy, so classification, uh, phenology, my PhD was based on stuff about the timing of life history events in Lepidoptera. But today I'm going to go back to what I think my original interest in this group and talk about coloration. And uh, I'm pleased the title is intriguing. That's good. So what, to give you a little summary, what I'm going to do first off is talk very generally about different kinds of um, co adaptive coloration in Lepidoptera. And then I'm going to zero in on a couple of these that I find particularly interesting and hopefully and emphasize particularly camouflage or crypsis and hopefully maybe change your perspective on that just a little bit. Let's see if it works. Okay, this works, that's good. So I always have to start off a talk about coloration by giving you this general slide like this, just showing you some of the huge diversity of coloration that you can see in the animal kingdom and in among the plants too. Now, the sheer diversity of coloration in uh, animals and plants has a long history of fascination among biologists and you can kind of follow the thread of the history of biology through the study of coloration going back to aristotle who talks about color changes in octopus when their mood changes through to like erasmus darwin charles darwin um so it is it is a subject of enduring fascination for people um and it always has a good reception at talks like this compared to my phonology talks anyway so if you think about the functions of of coloration in in lepidoptera specifically you can kind of classify these into two really broad groups. So on the one hand, physiological functions, to, so functions to do with the running of the body, and just very generally signaling, so really broadly defined, signaling among organisms. So as a, a physiological function, one of the things we can think about is thermoregulation. This one's quite well known. So we can see this among Lepidoptera in gradients in uh, light-dark coloration. So they tend to get darker as you increase latitude and altitude so they can uh, absorb uh, heat more efficiently. We all know this from clothing. You know, if you wear light colors, it's, it's much cooler in sunny places. Some colors give uh, actually inherent physical protection. So melanin can stop cell damage from ultraviolet light. Again, this is something we all know very intuitively, but you can see this uh, reflected among Lepidoptera too. In terms of the signaling functions, we have what are called intraspecific and interspecific functions. So that's um, signals between individuals of the same species and signaling between individuals of different species. And these can be antagonistic or mutualistic, so basically good and bad. So they can be to the benefit of an individual or to the benefit of both. I'm going to zero in on these uh, between species functions this afternoon, uh, this morning, I should say. A really uh, well known example of this is uh, aposematic coloration. So this is where you have really conspicuous, contrasting colors placed together on an individual, and it usually signals toxicity or um, uh, some kind of defensive mechanism that could harm a predator. So in this case, these uh, burnet moths accumulate toxins from the host plants, so they're not, um, not, it's not wise to eat one. I always think burnet moths are hilarious because you can sort of jab them as they're sitting somewhere and they just do nothing. They just sit there. They're so un unused to being harassed. So the, the flip side of that is uh, mimicry. So the most um, well-known example of this is Batesian mimicry, so named after um, Henry Bates. And the idea here is that while you as an individual yourself can't cause any harm, or maybe you're not toxic, you just come to resemble a species that is toxic, and you kind of masquerade as that, and that's your defensive mechanism. So obviously this, these hornet moths, the whole group of them that resemble um, bees and wasps, and they have this characteristic color pattern. So they're harmless, but they come to resemble something that isn't harmless. So there are two kinds of between species signals that I want to zero in on this morning. And it's what I call really broadly concealed contrasting colors or concealed conspicuous colors. And then I'm going to lead into uh, talking about crypsis or camouflage. So very broadly defined, you see very commonly among Lepidoptera this pattern where individuals are cryptic when they're at rest, and they can deliberately uh, display some kind of bright contrasting color. So here you have exactly the same coloration you find on bees, wasps, and so on. 
this yellow black contrasting color and in large yellow underwings when they fly off all of a sudden this color becomes suddenly visible but when they're at rest they're very very cryptic or camouflaged so there are three really broad explanations that have been proposed for this phenomenon and they kind of blend into one another but they're quite separate explanations so i want to kind of just go through the, those with you i think it's very likely that they all operate kind of in tandem but that will become clearer as we go along so the first potential explanation is called um is uh deflective colors so the idea here is that this large yellow underwing is very camouflaged when it's at rest and it suddenly becomes disturbed by a bird that's coming along to eat it all of a sudden it flies off it flashes these yellow colors and the bird's attention is immediately drawn to the yellow colors so when it attacks it that's where the attack is directed. And so it directs the attack away from the center, the key parts of the body. Startle coloration is, is kind of related, but slightly different. So the idea here is that you suddenly expose bright colors or eye spots or something like that. And that frightens the predator. So it's instead of its attention being misdirected, it's kind of startled, it takes a step back, gives you time to escape before it attacks you. And a good, nice example of the eyed hawk moth here. So the last one, this is my favorite one because I think it's, it's so subtle, flash coloration. So the idea here is that you have your little moth in the corner. This is just a little example. And it has cryptic forewings, brightly colored hind wings. And so when it's flying along, you can see the bright color. And the idea is you as a predator are following it as it flies along. And all of a sudden when it lands somewhere, suddenly it's camouflaged. So that bright color vanishes and you're just taken aback and it makes it difficult to follow the moth and find out exactly where it is that it stopped. So hopefully this animation will work and it'll give you an idea. Something like this. Yeah. yeah. So your, your eye kind of immediately follows the bright line. Um, and so anyway, that's theoretically how this, this mechanism is supposed to work. So you can see how each one of these could kind of be operating in the same system. There's kind of overlapping effects here. But trying to disentangle these different explanations. There's a lot of room, I think, for contributions to science. The literature is really quite, is quite vague on a lot of these, and the definitions are even often very blurred. So I was writing about this recently, I discovered that there's actually very little literature, for example, on a really common species like the Red Admiral, about, um, trying to work out what are the functions of the coloration here. You can see it's kind of cryptic underside, but it has this black-red contrasting upper side. And there's actually very little, very few experiments that have been conducted to try and work out for example, is it aposomatic? Is it distasteful? It's not really very well known. So there's lots of scope for contributions by enthusiasts. So Crypsis. Oh, this is everyone's favorite thing. A couple of really broad examples here. Um, I love the one with the leopard. It's very menacing. Um, another example is porcelain crabs, one of my favorite things. So they have all these little hairs and they collect detritus and algae and they're, they're it's just so perfectly matched to the underside of boulders on intertidal zones and a nice little mountain here in its winter winter coat. Of course, you can find a whole plethora of examples of exquisite camouflage in Lepidoptera. One of my favorites is the Mervu du Jour. Um, you can see conveniently placed on some lichen here for the purposes of this photograph. Um, but re really, really exquisitely camouflaged. I mean, even when you see them, old specimens pinned in a drawer somewhere, it just leaps out to you that it, it looks so much like, like lichen. Buff tip is another lovely example. Um, whenever you see a photograph of a buff tip, it's always been placed on a twig. There's another one. So um, I think this is nice because it emphasizes two different kinds of crypsis. So you have uh, what's called general protector resemblance or general kind of camouflage, where you just come to resemble the general colors and tones of an environment. So you slightly blend in. So the leopard, for example, would be an example of that. This is very specific resemblance. So the whole body has come to resemble an object in the environment, not just the general tones. And so the, the organism itself becomes like a, a little piece of plasticine that's like shaped almost to the, or, the thing that it's mimicking in the environment. So even the way that the wings are held at rest here are all kind of modeled along that. It's a very compelling resemblance. It's one of those kind of irresistible just so stories. It's another lovely example, feathered thorn. Um, an interesting point to note here is the lines that traverse both wings that give you this illusion of veins. Um, so you can see how the, the whole, the way that the wings rest kind of interacts with the color and it's become a palette on which these, these patterns have been painted. 
And of course, there's a whole group of moths that resemble bird droppings, which is is bizarre. And this kind of bird dropping mimicry, is a, a weird obsession that I have with this because it seems to have evolved so many times independently in so many different groups. Even in different families of Lepidoptera, you can find the same pattern. Really, really intriguing. But the kind of tones and the flecking and the shape, even again, the shape of the moth kind of lends some lends some credence to this. This is a slight diversion because we're off to North America now, but this is my favorite bird dropping mimic. So this is the larvae of the a giant swallowtail. You see the di distribution there, North America on the left. And uh, I don't know, it's just so compelling. You even kind of slightly disgusting, slimy texture. It's really, really compelling. <clears throat> so taking a step back for a minute and just to think a little bit more deeply about this crypsis or camouflage, I think we have to go back to very basics and think about what we what, what we actually mean by color. So fundamentally, color is a perception. It's a representation of the physical nature of the environment. So all these surfaces that we see, they have all the electromagnetic radiation coming into them. And the colors that we perceive them to be are the wavelengths of light that are reflected back, that aren't absorbed by the surface. And so it's obvious there there's a and our visual ability itself is shaped by natural selection. So primates, for example, seem to have a higher sensitivity to red colors because of well, one of the theories behind that is that it's to do with detecting ripeness in fruit in our kind of arboreal ancestors. So you see here there are two things going on. Being camouflaged depends on the colors of the environment, but also the ability of the predators to kind of perceive colors, like the range of colors that they're able to perceive. So the thing I want to come back to throughout this talk is that camouflage is as much an adaptation to the perception, the sort of visual abilities of the thing you're trying to deceive as it is to the environment itself. These two things are working in tandem. So let me give you an example of that. So it's a little fake background, the little triangles can be some fake moths. So imagine we have color vision. There are two species here. It's very obvious one of them is much more camouflaged than the other one. If we take a step back and change our visual system, so imagine we go to like a monochrome visual system now. I've taken the same image and just converted it to grayscale. So you can see here, if you have this visual system, suddenly both species look equally camouflaged or equally conspicuous, depending on how obvious you think they are. So the perception of predators, for example, it acts like a, a filter and that defines the set of, of colors that matter. So it, that defines the sort of color space that you need to be cryptic in. These two things are working in tandem. So I want to jump from that onto this idea of uh, cryptic polymorphism. So a nice little example, a lesser yellow underwing. I like all the underwing moths. Um, I think they're just so interesting. You think about camouflage, it's really the opposite of variation. You saw some like the buff tip, for example, earlier on. The idea is that you come to resemble an environment so perfectly that you're indistinguishable from, from it. That's the goal. So the idea is optimally converting on resembling the background, not being variable. But the fact is that many species that we see when we go out and we run the moth trap every evening, they are camouflaged and they are polymorphic or they are variable as well. So that's a bit of a, a conundrum. How can you have maximal resemblance to the environment on the one hand, but on the other hand, we go out and we find them and they're really variable. So we want to know how evolution promotes on the one hand variation or maintains variation, and on the other hand, tries to promote camouflage at the same time. But one of the really conventional explanations for this is you have, so this is again, two little fake moth species. If you have this checkerboard background, you can think of polymorphism as being an adaptation to a polymorphic environment. So in this case, you have black and white environments that are patched, patchworked together. Um, in this case, it's if you're intermediate in color between black and white, if you're gray, you're mismatched on both of the backgrounds. You're obvious wherever you go. So there's selection that drives them to either be black or white, and you end up with two color morphs. So kind of fake illustration there. The other kind of, uh, I think probably the more common kind of variation that we see, though, is something like um, you can see here in these winter moths. So don't really think of winter moths as being polymorphic, but they're actually quite variable within narrow bounds. And you see this really commonly, not, in just, not just in Lepidoptera, but much more broadly. You see a general resemblance to the background, but at the same time, lots and lots of color morphs. This is much more difficult to explain. So we have our two kind, kind of kinds of polymorphism here, cryptic polymorphism. How can we explain this kind on the right? 
No, I think if you go back to the literature, first inklings that a solution to this come from uh, E.B. Poulton, who some of you may have heard of. Really excellent book, The Colours of Animals, that you can still read today. It's like full of really good anecdotes. But he talks about the caterpillars of the large emerald moth, which have these two different colour forms, the green and brown form. And he writes about them that, in this case, because the thinking about why they might have these two different colour forms, he says that foals have a wider range of objects for which they may mistake the larvae, and their search must occupy more time for equivalent results than if they just had one colour more. So basically, they're making it more difficult for predators because they don't just need to look for one thing. They're trying to look for two things at the same time. So it reduces the overall kind of predation pressure. So we're kind of creeping towards a possible explanation here. Jump forward a little bit. The German biologist, not very well known today at all, um, Jakob von Jokesko. And, and this is a, a textbook that he wrote in German, a biology textbook. Um, it's not very readable today, I have to say, in contrast to Fulton's book. Um, so in this book, he has this interesting anecdote where he talks about visiting uh, a friend's house. And uh, every day, is, the friend would have a, a ceramic jug of water on the breakfast table. And von Jukesko comes down one morning and he wants a drink and there's nothing there. And he asks his friend, um, can I have some water, please? And his friend says, well, it's right there. And he describes how all of a sudden he turns around and he says something like, all oh, the shards of light suddenly come together. And I realize, oh, there is a carafe there. It's just not ceramic, it's glass. And so trying to explain why he failed to see the carafe, trying to discuss it in modern terms, he, um, and he gives all kinds of similar wacky examples like frogs thinking matchsticks are worms and so on. Basically, what his argument comes down to is that the processing ability of your brain is limited, like a computer. I think it's about the, your um, optic nerve, I think, has the processing ability of an Ethernet cable, I think, approximately. So the idea is you have this hugely information-rich environment that you're trying to process information from, and it's impossible to take in all the information that's coming in. So you have to apply what's called selective attention. You have to devote some portion of your attention to one particular set of information that's coming in from the environment and ignore everything else. So this is called attentional filtering. So his explanation behind the whole thing with the, when he missed the carafe was that his mind had such a firm, fixed image of what he was expecting to see, and the fact that the carafe, the new one, was glass and it was like slightly camouflaged, that when he, when he glanced around the table, he just couldn't perceive it because his mind had such a firm idea of what it was already looking for. This idea went kind of unnoticed for a long time, and then in the 1960s, Luke Timbergen kind of revived it. So he was in the Netherlands, he was looking at the control of uh, insect populations in pine woodlands. One of the things he looks at is uh, predation of these uh, Bupalus moths by, by great tits. And he goes out and he records how common the moths are in the environment and how frequently they are brought back by the birds as uh, food for their nestlings. This is one of the example graphs that he gives. So basically along the bottom, this is how common the moths are in the environment. And on the left, how frequently they're brought back as food. And the bold line that I've put on in the middle is what you would expect if the birds were just foraging randomly and they were just bumping into them. So that's a random chance based on how frequently the moths are found in the environment. Now, the dots are his actual records of um, how frequently they're brought back. And what you can see is that when the moths aren't very common, the birds bring them back less than we would expect by chance. And when the moths are very common, they tend to bring them back more than we would expect by chance. And this is just one example graph. So he found that in general, across lots of different insects, in the diet of these birds, there was an underrepresentation of prey species that weren't very common and an overrepresentation of ones that were very common. So to try and explain this, he revived uh, von Jutzkel's idea of the search image. And I'll, I'll break that down for you and give you and see how you see how you think this works. So the idea again, visual environment, very complex, lots of information coming in. And birds have to go out and somehow search that environment for prey. And his idea is they would, they would, the birds would just wander along and they would, by chance, come across something that they could eat and they would consume it. And they would remember what it looked like, essentially. So they would say, okay, the visual characteristics of this thing, this is what prey looks like. Like von Juxko remembering the carafe's image. And the idea is then they would use those visual characteristics as a filter and apply it to all the information that's coming in from the environment. So they would be more likely to pick up things that look similar. I mean, we all kind of know this. If you know what you're looking for, it's easier to find something. And the idea is they would use that image, and if it was very productive, they would keep on using it. It would become reinforced in their mind. 
if it wasn't becoming very productive, then they would gradually forget about it. They'd come across another prey item. They would remember what that looked like, reinforce that image instead. So Timbergen explained this by saying, the overpredation of common prey results from the birds finding one of those, learning a search image and applying it in the environment. There's no point learning an image of a prey item that's really rare because you're not likely to find it anyway. So you get then a tendency for them to consume more of a really common species and less of ones that aren't very common. Let me kind of break that down again. And his idea was then that differences in the abundance of different prey species determines which ones are predated. So you have a bird coming along, randomly goes through the environment, finds one of these little caterpillars, and it thinks, oh, this is what prey looks like. So it goes off, and it's much more likely to find one of those now. So it predates lots of them. The numbers go down. Other prey species, the numbers go up. Suddenly it finds this isn't a very productive image before uh, anymore. I'm not really finding many prey. So it bumps into one of these by chance. It's like, oh, maybe this is a good image. And it goes and searches the environment for these. So it may have a couple of things, a couple of images in its mind at the same time. They gradually get strengthened or they get forgotten, depending on which ones are most useful. And so you can see how it kind of leads to this thing where the common species get predated very heavily, get eaten very heavily, and the rare ones don't. Fast forward a little bit. Again, this is Brian Clark, who worked on polymorphism at Edinburgh for a little bit. And his idea was, um, he took this concept and kind of ran with it. So he said, well, from the bird's point of view, they're not predating different species. They're just predating things that look different. They're just going out and hunting things that look different. So there's no real difference between different species and a species that has lots of very distinct color morphs. The birds just see these as different things. And he worked a lot on banded snails, which some of you might be familiar with. And his idea was basically that you get that same, that same uh, mechanism of common color forms being predated within a species, as you will, between different species. So if you have a, a, one of these color morphs that's particularly common, you can imagine the birds remembering what that one looks like, predating that one very heavily, and these other ones managing to evade that image. Because if you're saying the search image acts like a filter, so although it makes it more common that you will see something that matches your image, it makes it more likely, like von Jukskull in his glass carafe, that you'll miss something that doesn't conform to the image that you have in your mind. Yeah, so the idea is using search predators that use search images to try and overcome camouflage, they'll exert this pressure within different species where common color forms are predated very heavily. And so this is the flip side of search image use, that looking different means you're more likely to evade a search image that a predator is using. And so this, coming back all the way back to the beginning with the, this idea of this general polymorphism, this could present, present a potential explanation for why we see this kind of really general polymorphism. So a general kind of camouflage in an environment, but at the same time, lots of variation. So there's a tension between selection on the one hand to be camouflaged, and on the other hand, a selective pressure as well to deviate from search images that predators are using. So it doesn't pay to be too conspicuous because then you'll be spotted like a mile away. But at the same time, you don't want to be you don't want to be too similar to the rest of the color forms because then you'll be caught picked out by the birds using that search image. So there's these two tensions going on, and this leads to a proliferation of lots of color forms that vaguely resemble each other, but they're not identical. So I'll give you an example from um, my work specifically now. So this is a Bernard Kettlewell, some of you will know. Um, for most, probably for his work on peppered moths, which are really famous now, is taught in biology classes all around the world. This idea of search images and polymorphism had kind of become quite well known by the time he was writing this book in 1973. And he more preempted Kettlewell here. So that's basically what he says. Images, search image use is very well established. And the idea is that if you look different, you're more likely to evade a search image. So you might be at an advantage. And then he goes on to talk about um, moths that are active in uh, Europe in winter. And he says that it's very common in these kind of, uh, these kind of species. And then he talks about um, how common it is. He gives an example. So he says, in Britain, there are a dozen species of Macroleptoptera hatch in the coldest months of the year. And he mentions how polymorphic these species are. He says they have at least three different morphs and the morphs are themselves very variable. So um, this was a, a few years ago. Yeah, to give you some examples, dotted border again, they're all kind of similar, but they're also different. Mottled umber, another good example. Um, you can see how they all kind of cluster together and being generally camouflaged, but again, all different color morphs. 
a not chewed example here. A nice little chestnut moth. Again, kind of generally similar, but there's some variation between them. It's very different from the kind of the black and white polymorphism that I mentioned earlier on. It's not really dis discrete, but you know, they kind of blend into one another. So if we have a look at these moths that are active in winter, based on Kettlewell's little anecdote, this is the basis of my research a few years ago. I went actually into the literature, had a look at this. If you look at the moth species that are active as adults in Britain um, between October and April, about 20% of them have more than 12 different colour morphs, like named um, within species colour morphs. But again, the primary defence against predation just seems to be crypsis. It just looks like they're trying to avoid predation. So I wanted to actually test, is this, uh, are these search images the, the driving factor behind the evolution of all these color morphs in these winter active moths? So I, I invented a little fake uh, moth species. You can see it's based on the mottled umber here. And you can see just poking out at the bottom a little mealworm that's pinned underneath these fake wings. So it acts like a, a little edible body. And uh, I went out into some woodlands and set these up in populations. I uh, invented a few different color morphs. So I just modified the RGB values of the colors um, by 25. So I had this little cluster of similar color morphs. So I went out into some um, pine woodlands in Fife and set them up in populations of 20 individuals. So each one's pinned to a different tree. And the idea is that the birds will come in, they'll find one, and they're like, oh, this is a good food source. And then they'll hop around and try and find similar ones. And the idea is in these little small populations, they should be encountering them sequentially and they should be forming a search image. So those pressures should exist. And so we can find out um, if they favor the really common color morphs, or favor the rare ones, I should say. So the birds come along, they predate them. So I left them out for 24 hours and came back and recorded the predation on the different color forms. Changed the population, different color forms, different frequencies, did it again. So I'm varying the frequency of each color form and using different color forms. Again. Okay. So what I found is, uh, that very simply put, this graph on the bottom shows you how common the color form is in the population, so from zero to one. And on the left-hand side, that's if you're an individual that belongs to that color form, how likely is it that you're going to be eaten? So if color doesn't affect how likely you are to be eaten, if the frequency of your color morph doesn't matter, this number on the left should only be determined by how many are eaten overall. So if the population is 20, the birds eat 10, your, your probability of being eaten should be 0.5. It doesn't matter what color you are. So it looks something like that. But instead, what I found when I uh, analyzed all these results, this is for one color morph, for example, this brown one, is it looks like this. So what this means is that as the color morph becomes more and more common in the population, it becomes disproportionately eaten by the birds. So this kind of supports the idea they're hopping around, they're finding ones that are common, they're forming the image in their mind, and they're looking out for that one specifically. And it's actually meaning they're missing morphs that look different because they have this firm image in their mind. So what I found is that as, the color, as a particular color morph becomes more common, the, the probability that it's going to be predated increases. So um, uh, I'll bring in the work here of uh, an undergrad student that I had a couple of years ago, Hannah Colburn, who kind of took this work a little bit further, and it's going to be published fairly soon, I think. Instead of using the moth models that I use, she used these little um, kind of ca fake caterpillar baits out of pastry and dyed them different colors uh, with food colorings. And she set them out in little squares of square populations. And so quite dense, it's like a, a meter squared. And she put lots of color forms in there. To, uh, and she uh, left them out for predation by wild birds. The birds would come in and pick, pick them. And you can see the magpies got one there. So again, just to simplify this, don't need to worry about the different colors. Along the bottom, this is how many color morphs were put out in this population. So in this case, one morph in the population. So the whole population has only got one color, up to five. And this is the time that the birds spent searching and uh, to hunt all the, the baits that they got. So you can see that as the population becomes more polymorphic, as there are more and more different color forms put in this little quadrat, the time that the birds spent hunting increases. So it seems that when you introduce a variation into populations, it takes the predators longer, just like Poulton said a uh, century ago, it takes the birds much longer to, uh, to find all the ones that they, that they wanted to clear out the population. Interestingly, she found, so in this case, the different lines are different species of bird. So the black one is a uh, crows there. She found that the effect was like different in different bird species. So again, it comes back to this idea of the predator psychology being really important. You're talking about the 
there's the environment on the one hand and then there's the sort of cognitive abilities of the predators on the other hand and this varies among different species so in the magpies for example it doesn't seem to be much of an effect it doesn't matter how polymorphic the populations were they just hunted them in the same same amount of time coming back to brian clark for a minute um he made an interesting kind of deduction he sort of thought that back, coming back to this idea of if a color form is very common it's going to be predated really heavily his idea was that if the species was rare, it doesn't really, it's not, there's not much point forming a search image of that species because you're not likely to find it anyway. As a species becomes more and more common, it becomes more likely that it's productive to use a search image of that particular prey item. So his uh, thinking was that as a prey species becomes more and more common, search images become more and more productive to use. And so the benefit of looking different from the image also increases. So what you'll find is that in much more common species, it's much more, you gain a much a greater advantage from looking different. So from this, he kind of deduced that really common species ought to be much more polymorphic than really rare species if search images were driving this kind of evolution. Um, because if you're, a, if you're a very rare species, you can just look camouflaged. It doesn't really matter because I'm not going to form an image of you because it's not productive. But if you're a really common species, you're subject to this really heavy pressure. <clears throat> some of you I'm sure will kind of probably have thought this just anecdotally as well it's really common species tend to be quite color polymorphic Kettlewell mentioned this about the winter active moths as well he said that among the most common the more common uh, species you find this really heavy polymorphism so I, I went out to test this a couple of years ago I wanted to find out if there's a relationship between how abundant different species of moth in the UK are and the number of named color forms. So I got the abundance data from Rothamsted, from the Rothamsted Light uh, Trapping Network. And I went back to the literature and tried to, as a very approximate measure of how variable they were, look at how many named color morphs there were. Um, the Victorian is very thorough about this kind of thing, so I thought it would be fairly reliable. And this is uh, what I found. So this is uh, species that are active between October and April as adults. And this is kind of complex. You don't need to bother about that, really. It's just like, how common they are along this axis. So as that goes up, they get more and more common. On the left-hand axis is how many named within species color morphs there are. And you can see as the species get more abundant, they get more and more named color morphs. So it does seem like in some groups, there's a really strong correlation here. In certain groups of uh, Lepidoptera, more common species really are more polymorphic. And in this case with the winter active uh, moths. So again, this is consistent with this idea that a really major selective pressure out there in the real world is predators like birds going around, forming search images, hunting to those images, and disproportionately predating really common uh, color forms of different species. And that drives the evolution, new color morphs that look different. I feel like I'm laboring the point, but it takes a long time. It took me a long time to get my head around this. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of scope here. This is a really widespread cause of polymorphism. I'm sure all of you who do light trapping know that it's such a widespread phenomenon to see species that are generally kind of camouflaged. They sort of match the general tones of the natural world, but at the same time, they're also polymorphic. So, again, there's a lot of scope for uh, work on this. How, how much of a driver of polymorphism is this kind of selection? And this is just, I mean, just one of hundreds of examples you could have here. Um, so it could be a really major force. And again, the work just really hasn't been done on it. It could be a, a huge driver of um, driving the color patterns of these different species in nature. So just to wrap everything up, I'm doing quite well for time here. I'm quite happy with myself. <clears throat> so just to kind of sum all those various threads and pull them together. Lepidoptera have a huge array of uh, really complex adaptive strategies in terms of their coloration. And I've really only scratched the surface of just to what I've just covered really two major um, forms of adaptive coloration. The reason I, I took time at the beginning to mention this idea of concealed conspicuous coloration or concealed contrasting coloration is that I think it's a really ignored strategy and I think it's underappreciated. Those three different explanations Still, I mean, the work hasn't been done to try and pick those apart. Maybe one of them doesn't really work, and it's not just simply not been tested experimentally. So there's lots and lots of room for contributions to the literature there. The other point that I really want to emphasize is that all of these different strategies arise through a really complex interaction. It's, it's not just about the colors of the environment. It's about the 
cognitive abilities, the visual abilities of the organisms that you're trying to deceive or the organisms that are perceiving you. So it's about the um, brains of the predators as much as it is about the properties of the environment that you're trying to resemble. Or, or whatever. And I think that as I've tried to, I'm taking you through the story of this explanation for cryptic polymorphism, I think in many cases, uh, adaptive coloration needs to be understood through this. There's like, it is, it is fundamentally signaling and there are two parties involved and you need to consider it through this interplay of predator cognition and the environment, the properties of the environment. And as I've kind of mentioned all the way through, even in Britain, I think there's a huge amount of scope for um, future observation and experiment trying to pick apart the various uh, explanations for the huge diversity of coloration that we see in, in UK Lepidoptera. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jamie. That was a brilliant keynote. I absolutely love your inventors of mealworm models. How many of those did you have to pick up? <laughs> yeah, there's like a thousand, I think. A thousand. Yeah, I think thousand. so, yeah. Yeah. Do we have... Wasn't, wasn't fun at the time. It wasn't fun at the time. I bet. Yeah. Do we have any questions for Jamie in the room? Yeah, so the question was that um, if common species are more polymorphic, and rare species, there's not really that selective pressure to be polymorphic. What happens if a common species becomes rare? So I suppose you could you could imagine that the polymorphism would be maintained a bit because there wouldn't be necessarily selection against it. Um, I think it would slowly, you could have the effects of drift maybe on the one hand, so they would stay in the population for a while. And I think it would depend the environment that they're in, how strong the selective pressure was for crypsis. If they had a very variable environment, maybe they would, it would last longer. But I think there would be a general trend towards convergence back on a different environment. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question, though. I'm not. It's, there must be um, must be scope to investigate that now, especially with populations declining. So. Another PhD student. Yeah, yeah. I love funding for myself. I think is far <laughs> the priority at the moment. Uh, so the, the question was that um, some common species are also really generalist in terms of the host plants that they that they eat. So I wonder if that could possibly contribute to the coloration that they have. Um, I think it's difficult to disentangle the effects of host plant from habitat because they're so tightly tied to one another. Um, and in each case, you it depends on the individual behavioral characteristics of the species involved. Maybe they have very particular resting sites and that affects the pressure on the the coloration. So I'm not I'm not aware of anything. There's, a, 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 there's some work on what's called polyphenism where the diet affects the, the um, morphology of the adults and the coloration. I'm not sure of anything really general that suggests different host plants can lead to lots of different color morphs. It tends to be very specific. So you'll have a brown form or a green form and it depends on the food plants that they've been or the particular parts of the host plant that they've eaten. I'm not aware of anything that suggests different host plants lead to different colours. Um, it's certainly possible with different secondary chemicals in the plants, um, but I'm not aware of that. I mean, it's certainly certainly possible though. That's why you can really only deal in really broad generalities. Um, you saw the really positive correlation that I showed you in the moths that were active in winter. If I showed you the graph I made across all of Lepidoptera, there is no correlation. So... It seems to be this I, this whole search image phenomenon driving polymorphism. It perhaps only works, it only operates really strongly in some really narrowly defined groups of Lepidoptera. But again, that's not really very well understood. So that's an interesting point, though. Thank you. So the, the question was about the um, the time frame over which they can kind of come to the birds can potentially come to learn search images and how long they retain them in their mind. So I think this is a really fascinating subject, which is why I wanted to mention Hannah's work really quickly because it shows that there is this huge scope for differences among different species. And um, I think in the case of that particular experiment, it might be that the magpies just have a higher processing capacity in their brain. So they don't, it's not that they can remember more search images, it's just that they don't suffer the, um, the setbacks that the crows have. So the crows maybe have a more limited uh, visual kind of processing capacity. So they have to form the images. So you see that effect, but the magpies can just process everything together. Um, but I think there's a huge amount of scope for work on that. I know that um, Mike Majiris, who some of you might have heard of uh, from Cambridge um, a couple of decades ago, did some work where he looked at search images and found that they were formed in crows over the course of a few days. My experiments, I think it was mostly 
or passerines that were predating them. So some of the, I should have actually showed you a picture, some of those little fake wings had little beak impressions on them. So I was able to get, because the birds would something pull them off, eat the mealworms, so I found the wings on the ground. So I could kind of get a rough idea of what birds were involved. So with the passerines, it seemed like they could form the image in a matter of a few minutes, just how long it takes them to, to predate this little dense population of moths I put out. So there's a huge amount of variation there, and I just think it's just not understood well at all. Yeah. So thank you very much, Jamie. That was that was a great opening talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. So we have a little bit of a forestry theme taking us up to lunchtime. So next up, I would like to welcome David Bryant with Moths of Highland Clearfells, Devastation or Opportunity? This uh, talk uh, started with Tom, known to most of you here, when he organised the Kedish Glory survey when uh, pheromone lures first became available. And this took me back to a, a place that I had taken my light trap many times, hunting for Kentish Glory, and never had found it. We then took it to a, a, a site and used these lures, and sure enough, these Kentish glory moths turned up in all their glory. And what I'm going to expound today is the idea that a rather awful part of the forestry time uh, cycle of uh, management leaves the the, for, the removed forest in a state when if you've ever tried to walk across a clear fell you'll find yourself uh, either with a broken leg or something but something equally as bad so basically my talk is about management of forests and the rather cheeky suggestion that they should be managed in a way which promotes the benefits of the wildlife there rather than just the the budget at the end of the end of the growth cycle. So there's a long history of management of woodland and forest, uh, and this, this is not particularly about woodland management, it's more about commercial forest management, but the examples I've chosen here to illustrate historic and current uh, activity in the field of, of management of, of woodland and forest our advice to leave timber to decay on site, that's now become a, a sort of the thing to do. Anyone that holds woodland that is interested in wildlife management leaves timber to, to decay on site. Maintain glades to allow flowers to grow and sun to come in, and that helps a whole range of species, particularly butterflies. Uh, and the checkered skipper story in England, at least, of extinction and management of rides and reintroducing Kentish uh, checkered skipper uh, is a, a very nice story of successful conservation within uh, within a woodland habitat. The Heath Fritillary, which I've had personal experience of with a, a re-establishment site in Cornwall, where it's wonderful to see so many of these beautiful little moths uh, following a, a few years of habitat management to create the right conditions for them, which was learnt from experience uh, in the southeast of England and applied in Cornwall. And sure enough, it yielded the benefit of uh, flourishing populations of Heath Fertillery. There's a, uh, I think, a, a BC project to establish uh, connections between habitat islands for the benefit of the declining high brown fertility. Again, south of the border example. It's right that I give you some local examples. Uh, some several people here are involved with work with the beautiful snout in the Trossachs, where the main management technique is ro roadie bashing. The dark watered beauty on Speyside involves, and this is a, a new project and it seems to be going in a very promising direction, uh, and that involves aspen management in a, a different, a wide range of, as well as reintroductions. The scarce Mauvais de Jour, de Jour project uh, is mainly about conservation of prime habitat, uh, oak 
forest in the, the south of England. But really, the reason to include it here is to show you this beautiful moth, uh, which it's hard to resist. And then the, there's another story from the Lake District about the netted carpet. And that's a rather different perspective on it, where you need ground disturbance to get the food plant to, to flourish. That's touch me not balsam. And if you do that, then the, the netted carpet should benefit. So there's a, a, a small variety of management techniques which help wildlife to flourish in a context of a woodland or a forest. So th this is where we went with our lures with the, for the Kentish glory. Uh, it lay underneath the Bully Denny uh, power line. And where power lines are established, uh, there's often a, a, a requirement to leave the ground underneath uh, unmanaged so that the, you don't have to keep chopping the trees down until they touch the overhead wires. This wasn't really a, 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 a reason to follow this particular site. Uh, it was more that it was a site that looked promising because it had a, a wide variety of herbs as well as the, the prime interest of the Kentish glory being there with uh, modestly sized uh, birch saplings. So my question uh, going into this, and this study was carried out with uh, my friend, my late friend, uh, Gerald Lincoln. Uh, our question was, are Cleophels significant for macro moths? And are they, if they are, because we found the Kentish glory here, uh, are they broadly comparable with natural wooded or open habitats? If clear fells such as this are simply colonized by ubiquitous moths, then perhaps they're not so interest, interesting. But if they could be colonized by and populations maintained of, of species of uh, macro moth, which are of conservation interest, then perhaps there's something we should be doing with habitats such as this. So what first attracted us to the Rannoch area? Uh, well, it was really we wanted to go where we had a, a good chance of getting some unusual moths uh, in order to push the conservation case. Uh, it's, it's hard to argue that clear fells should be kept uh, for the sake of the large yellow unwing populations, but if you, there are a whole lot of really attractive moths, uh, then that would make the case better. So into the, the highlands we went, and I think subliminally, the idea that you would see Rannoch Brindle Beauty, Rannoch Looper, and Rannoch Sprawler, none of which uh, I had seen before, uh, was to do with the name. I mean, Rannoch is, only one of it is is the only place in the UK where there are three moth species which are named after or around the the name of the site. I think Jersey is a con, another contender, so it somehow creates a, a lure that brings you towards this. And the the Kentish glory isn't named uh, the Rana glory, although perhaps it should be. So this was the pheromone survey. And as I say, the, the site lay under the Billy Denny power line and it had been cleared, clear felled for that to be put in place. And it was uh, about five to 10 years old. And that was one of our sites. And it, we'd already no noticed that it was a very rich site in due course, we thought, well, actually, we'd better try and generalize this idea of the clear fell that we're looking at and go for one which is more typical. And so we went for a clear fell that was about five years post restock, replanting, but had a rather poor, uh, poor uh, flora. Uh, and it, it, it looked much less promising. So the expectation was, as we went into the study, if they're any useful, 
from species apart from Kentish glory, for which they are definitely useful, and Tom and all the other people that work with uh, Kentish glory know this already, we were wondering if there was another community that was equally important. And the expectation was that the natural woodland, the natural birch woodland in this area, which is beautiful, and the particular area where we went into was an SSSI, so it was high quality birch woodland. That would be the place where we'd find most interesting species uh, and the Kentish glory. The second site would be the this rather floriferous uh, clear fell. Uh, that would be the second best and the third best and lagging by a long way would be these recent restocks surrounded by spruce uh, and just with rather bare flora at the this stage of things. So I'm not going to list the, the species we came across, but I'll just show you serious series of pictures of the, the species we came across. And you'll see that many of them are, are very uh, much wanted, both as part of uh, the ecology of the area, but also just beautiful to see. So we've got uh, broom dip, uh, angle-striped sallow, Saxon across the top. And then a couple of specialities of this area, which would be the, the narrow-bordered bee hawk moth and the ringed carpet. Now, the little glitch in the study, which we haven't found a way to completely get hold of, is that the if you're sampling sites which are of uh, clearfell sites, which are within a, a forest, then you might get some interaction between them. So you might be drawing into your clearfell site uh, moths from the nearby birch woodland. And equally, you might, from in your birch woodland site, be drawing uh, moths using your light traps uh, from the other habitat. And you can see here the I've identified the broom tiff as likely being actually uh, originating in terms of its uh, development from from the clear fell uh, angle striped sallow, probably not most likely from the birch. And then it's uncertain where the Saxons came. So the, 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 that doubt, which which uh, was an integral part of the study, and that's perhaps where our next phase might go. But we try to allow for this in certain ways. And obviously, we used uh, various methods. And we used the pheromones. We used a whole range of light traps. Uh, we made sure our trapping areas were uh, distant, were well separated. Our traps were set at dusk and then ID'd at dawn. And our focus was largely in the context of the time on the larger moths. But the particular feature of our light trapping regime was that we incorporated a, a, a high, highish proportion of uh, heath traps. These are just six watt, uh, the ones I want to particularly draw attention to, the six watt heath traps, which would draw from a much smaller distance than the, the, the powerful uh, 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 mercury vapor Robinson traps. So there's possibly uh, within the trapping regime that we used a way of identifying the source from those moth species that were drawn particularly to the to the heath trap, the small heath traps. I'm not going to say anything about that, but that's a, a, a feature that could be incorporated in such a study. And we have the data to analyze it, but I haven't done that yet. Here's some more clear fell species. Uh, Perhaps the, the star of this lot is the cousin German, uh, widely recognized as a, a species of conservation concern, but much more likely to be uh, originating, well, certainly originating from the, the nearby birch. Whereas the ring carpets, as I, I've said, 
well, I haven't said that, the reed carpets actually could have come from either site because the food plant of the reed carpet was present in both areas. So here's the, a few more species. And here's the, the raw results. So on the left-hand side, we've got the number of trapping nights or trap nights, and the study extended from 2017 until 2020. The 2017 section was the primary focus at the, for, on the Kentish glory, and it was the experience of doing that that encouraged us to go back for the, the next three years. And you can see the effort we put in increased through time, uh, just 11 uh, trap nights, that's the number of nights times the number of traps. Uh, the next, and we got up to over 100 uh, trap nights, and that was our trapping effort. The number of species that was yielded from the birchwood, uh, the clear fell underneath the pylons and the clear fell within the, the spruce forest was 81, 98, and 97. So you could see that the, the, the clear fells were actually marg at least marginally, perhaps significantly, uh, but only just better than the birchwood for the richness of the moth, the macro moth uh, community. But perhaps more notably is that the, the number of species uh, of conservation concern or notable species, these are the ones list, listed by uh, Roy Leverton in his uh, periodic uh, assessment of the status of Scottish moths, uh, NA and NB. So these notable species are those of conservation concern or rarity. And actually, to our surprise, the, the, the native birch woodland was a, a less uh, productive habitat in terms of species richness than the other two. And furthermore, it was more productive of uh, the scarce and notable species. And the last column there on the right is merely a uh, just a statistic I came up with to do with the number of records and you can see that that doesn't differ so much and certainly not in a systematic way and the 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 things that will confirm one's expectation about it is that the the new clear fell with a rather poor uh, flora at the time we were sampling it uh, yielded a smaller number of moths than did the uh, the, the, the did the birchwood, which was productive. So that's a combination of number of species and number of individual statistic. So a final slide on bus moth uh, anomalous and northern deep brown diet. Dart some more uh, examples. Now we come to the bit of whether clear fells are going to be a useful conservation tool or whether it's something we can't expect to be able to benefit from to a significant degree with regard to its moth populations. What usually happens in a clear fell, as far as I'm uh, able to understand, I'm not in the business, and I think uh, some uh, people here will be far, far more familiar with uh, forestry operations than I am. But the usual treatment when you take down your harvest of uh, spruce or whatever it is, is that you follow that up with a herbicide treatment, fungicide treatment, and insecticide treatment in order to cleanse the habitat, in order that you primarily get rid of uh, a range of pest species, but in particular the pine weevil, which is a can be devastating in a, a plantation. And, uh, Additional tool for doing that is to allow a interval for the, the pine weevil merely to die off in the absence of any pine trees to, to cash in on. 
Uh, typically, uh, I think replanting or restocking occurs two years after uh, the timber has been extracted, uh, and that deals a blow to the, the pine weevil populations. Ideally, from a perspective of conserving the entomological side of the, the clear fell, one would like to leave that for longer uh, in order that the flora develops and colonization takes place. But could this fight against, if one were to do that, could this fight against all these pressures to uh, get the trees away and replant and get a new crop growing and bring in the profit from the, the growing of the trees? If one could leave it for longer, a Kentish, Kentish glory would be the, the a principal beneficiary but what is there a suite of other things that would come in? And we've demonstrated uh, in the previous slide that yes, they are very rapidly colonized and develop uh, a community which is not only large, but rich in uh, key species. However, the overall conclusion, given the commercial pressures in this context is that uh, extending the lifespan of clear fells is apparently commercially unattractive at present, and that being the case, it's unlikely to happen to any significant degree. So a few more specialities from the area. A couple of that I haven't mentioned hitherto is that this clear, the main clear fell we looked at was Watching with silvery arches, which is a, a threatened and a, a rare moth. And up in the top right hand corner, the slender striped rufus, which is actually here in the, the traditional area where mothers have been going to look for it for a very long time. And just to show you that I'm not a complete idiot when it comes to my, micromoths. This rather beautiful little micromoth was one of the ones that we, I think we were happy to identify, but it is uh, a rare and unusual example. There were a whole lot of other nice micros too, but I haven't incorporated them in this analysis. Rather more optimistically, I was hunting around for things that might be done in order to extend the period that a clear fell was there and was producing uh, moths and attracting others to breed there. So what are the other ways of uh, controlling uh, pine weevil rather than using uh, chemicals is you can debark stumps or remove the stumps altogether, again, costly. Use biological control of the weevils uh, if that such is available. You could restock the sites with uh, weevil resistant plants. And you could also tweak timing in order to avoid the peaks of weevil activity because the weevils will only be attacking the, the, the young restocks. So if one could apply these methodologies rather than the attacking it with chemicals, you could let and uh, leave the sites to lie fallow for a, a longish period. Uh, then, and especially if you were able to uh, allow restocks to regenerate themselves and then uh, deal with that later, because restock uh, naturally, uh, sorry, re regenerating forests are uh, less likely to get pine weevils than are uh, planted stocks. So just possibly, and I don't think it's for me to judge this, it's probably for the commercial uh, plantation operators, but perhaps if you had a, a subset of uh, plots within a forest that could lie fallow for, uh, un, uh, as, uh, lie fallow for uh, five years or so, 
then you could get some of the benefit. And the particular beneficiary, I think, that the, such a project might be aimed at is the, the Kentish glory. So the conclusion of our study is that the would-be uh, biodiversity benefits, particularly benefiting the Kentish glory in the Eastern Highlands, but there was also a significant suite of other notable moths that would likely benefit too. And then the one doesn't want to be too blinkered about what one's trying to aim our conservation measures for, because a whole lot of species of bird, tree pivot, willow warbler, white throat, for example, are very common in these clear fells. Uh, and there's a whole suite of other insects, butterflies and bees. More needs to be done, however, to justify uh, going ahead with such a program uh, with the fairly scanty and preliminary evidence that we've been able to do. So establishing the whether the species of conservation concern that are brought into these or colonized uh, clear fells are drawn there because they have their food plants there. Uh, that would justify it. If it turns out that a significant proportion of these are merely uh, immigrants from uh, nearby birch forest to our light traps, then that wouldn't be such a good idea. But as I've said, using very short range uh, attractant uh, six watt heath traps does allow one to be slightly more uh, confident that they are breeding within within these clear fells. The other and final concern that I'd like to mention is whether this is something that can be done without considering the wider context. Clearly, uh, the Rannock area is well known to be rich in moths, uh, and perhaps the uh, rapid and interesting colonizations that went place of these went took place in these clear fells was because it was in such a rich context. Maybe then this has to be a, a an idea which might fly within a, a a rich generally rich area, but might be a, a waste of time in terms of an an area a clear fell isolated from a, a richer context. And so there are lots of questions to ask, and I hope uh, we'll see, because I know that there's work going on uh, to, to see if there are opportunities that can be generalized from a study such as this. Okay, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. That was really thought-provoking and some great photos as well. Okay, so following on quite nicely from David's talk, we have MSc student Aaron Irvin, who's going to be talking about investigating clear fell sites for checkered skipper habitat suitability. Hi everyone, um, I'm Erin and I'm actually an uh, undergrad student, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> um, so I did my dissertation this year on investigating clear fell sites for checkered skipper habitat suitability. Um, so this was in um, with the University of Aberdeen, as well as um, the project being um, given to me by Butterfly Conservation. So a little bit about the checkered skipper. So this is just a photo of uh, the butterfly here. Um, it's quite elusive, um, it's quite rare, and it's only found in a 30 mile radius surrounding Fort William. Um, the habitat that it likes, um, it likes open broadleaf woodland in damp herb rich grasslands. Um, so it also has, um, well, obviously with its uh, food plant, purple moorgrass, as well as um, bracken and downy birch in the area. Um, it likes south facing slopes as they create warmer areas of habitat for them to bask in and for also for their larvae to grow, as well as proximity to locks. Um, they've seen to do well in um, areas where there's been clear, well, not clear fells, but um, clearings for clearings for power line maintenance um, and also where there's herbivore impact as this kind of clears some like the herbivores eat the shrubs it opens the habitat up and it means that more plants can grow through. So my project 
Um, so much of the area where the butterfly inhabits has had lots of subsequent um, clear felling and replant regimes over the past couple of decades. So um, it was interesting to kind of think about if the plants which the checker skipper uses or doesn't use um, has been growing up in these areas. So um, this project can provide foresters with lots of information about biodiversity of their woodlands and these clear fell areas and also to butterfly conservation with knowledge on this elusive butterfly. So this is one of the clear fell sites that I went to here and that's next to Loch Arcade and you can see some of the stumps from the trees that have been cut down. <coughs> okay so on to my field work. So um, I investigated 29 different sites over two and a half weeks in June last year. So Fort Williams in the middle there. Um, so yeah, so 27 of these, 26 of these sites, sorry, um, were clear fell sites. Um, this ranged from ages from one to 18 years. And three of the sites were my control sites, which were uh, three nat national nature reserves where um, the butterfly has a known population um, where they have been thriving and has that suitable habitat to allow them to persist. So one of the National Nature Reserves was up by Loch Arcaig on the uh, in the north, and then also that was Alpmic Butterfly Reserve, and then also um, Arundel Oakwoods National Nature Reserve down by Strontian, and then also Glastrum Wood National Nature Reserve in the south. So at each site, I would um, map randomly a couple of survey points that I would walk to using my GPS. And then when I got to these sites, I would measure out a five meter um, radius circle where I would uh, measure the percentage cover of 15 different plants associated with the butterfly. So it was a lot of plants. Um, so these are all the plant species I investigated. So um, obviously the purple moorgrass is their food plant. Um, bog myrtle and bracken and diner birch is kind of larval associated plants and then some of their um some of their nectar sources such as bell heather or um blue bell bugle herb um he's what orchid and then there's female associated ladies glove and marsh thistle and rushes and then also broadly trees and birch species that are kind of characteristic in their range so then some of the predictors of my data, um, so these are just kind of things that I investigated as I thought it would affect the cover of plants across um, my different sites. So we've got site type, whether um, the site is a clear fell or a national nature reserve to see if, um, well, if there's a similar cover of plants at these sites, which would be a good thing, or if it's different, maybe there's less at the clear fell and more at the uh, national nature reserve, which is kind of like, not so good <laughs> and then we've got age of clear fell to see whether if older sites maybe have more of the plants that are good for the checkered skipper butterfly um, or not and um, we've got herbivore presence and um, so that was measured through me um, looking at whether if there was heather in the area whether it was browsed by maybe by deer or if there was scat by herbivores or footprints um, and then we've got vegetation height so um, male checker skippers like to uh, bask and perch on uh, vegetation, usually like branches of birch trees um, from 40 to 50 centimetres in height. So I measured vegetation height and averaged that at all my different survey points to um, see if this was something that could be interesting to look at. Um, then we have south facing sites um, as these areas are warmer and they're thought to have better habitat for larval growth. So that was um, just measured online through like QGIS. And then I also took latitude and longitude into consideration also, um, as this may be something that could be affecting, well, the area of where the site was, whether there was more of one plant in the East or the West. Okay, so these are lots of photos from my summer during my field work. So um, it was quite sunny most of the time, but um, as you can see down here, it obviously wasn't, it is the West Coast, so there was lots of midges on that day, I had my, my midge net on. Um, so we got a nice view over from uh, North Balakush to like the Glencoe range and the big photo in the middle, it was a really nice view that day. Um, and then we've got me with my 
uh, measuring tape, measuring out my five meter radius circles with my map in my hand and my little notebook for taking notes. Um, so yeah, that was nice. And then I um, I track any butterflies that I saw when I was doing my surveys too. Um, obviously the weather's so changeable in the West Scotland. So I didn't like use it for any analysis or anything. So this is just a photo of a ringlet that I saw. It was really cute, but um, I didn't see any checkered skippers, sadly. I think it was really hot earlier in the season. So I think they might have already been and gone by the time I got out there. And then like against the notebook, that is some purple moorgrass. Um, above that is heath spot orchids. So that's their nectar plant. And then over at the far end, you can see um, my, my lunch basically. Um, <laughs> had a lot of uh, peanut butter and jam sandwiches. I was living in a hostel. There wasn't much cooking options. And then um, just my bag and my GPS and my maps and my notebooks that I would use every day. And um, I just thought it'd be good to include these. So on to results. So um, yeah, so I used RStudio, which is like a data analysis software on my laptop for all the percentage cover of plants that I found. Um, so when comparing this data from the clear file sites to the National Nature Reserves, um, it was found that there were significantly more purple moorgrass, bog myrtle, bracken, marsh thistle, and heath spotted orchids at the National Nature Reserve control sites compared to the clear files. Therefore, um, there may not be enough of the net of the food plants or the nectar plants or the larval associated plants at the clear files compared to the National Nature Reserves. Um, to host a population of the checkered skipper. However, this doesn't mean that the clear file sites are all that bad. I did find some good things. Um, <clears throat> so this is just a graph of my percentage covered um, found across all different sites. So we've got blue for the clear file sites and then orange it says adjacent, but it's um, the National Nature Reserves, the good sites basically. So um, as you can see there, um, common heather and ladies' glove were found significantly more at clear file sites. And um, this just means that they're quite good colonists on the west of Scotland, um, as well as ladies' glove being good nectar sources for other species such as bees. So just because it's not good for the checker skipper, it's still got something good going on in the environment. Um, Birch and broadleaf species, they had a non-significant result from um, the analysis. So they have a similar cover at both um, clear files and national nature reserves. Um, and this is the same with bell heather, crossleaf heather, rushes and bluebells. So three of the five nectar sources of the butterfly um, that was found at both site types with similar cover, indicating that there could be a some, uh, suitable amount of nectar at both sites investigated. Um, however, one of the nectar sources, uh, bugle herb, I didn't find it anywhere. And it's supposed to be one of the really good ones for the butterfly, so um, it couldn't be analyzed. Um, and to talk a bit more about the predictors. So age, that didn't explain any differences in the data. And that's quite an important finding as um, this that kind of tells us that even leaving the area just to colonize on its own for over 20 years, it doesn't create a habitat suitable for the checker skipper butterfly. Um, herbivore presence, um, when there was evidence of deer and sheep activity, um, there was more of the food plant purple moorgrass and associated bald myrtle found in the area. Um, for south facing sites, there was more uh, purple moorgrass found here. And this kind of supports other findings where, um, which have found that warm areas are good hotspots for the larval development and also just for the butterflies to bask in. And then for vegetation height, I've included a graph. It's quite a bit confusing. So. The blue bars are clear fell sites and the green bars are national nature reserves. And that's their average vegetation height in centimetres with the, the red buffer being 40 to 50 centimetres. So you can see that only two of the sites were actually 40 to 50 centimetres in height on average. Quite a lot of them surpassed this though. So this kind of tells us that they probably have lower down areas which can kind of host for perches for the males, but um, this is something that can be looked at with management, which I'm going to talk about next. So obviously um, we could create some openings in the woodland. Um, some people suggest that these should be 10 to 15 meters wide, um, 
wide, running from east to west, as then they'll be south facing. And that those will create warm pockets in the environment, and um, this will increase larval de development and growth. And these openings would also combat scrub invasion, and it could also lead to having plug plantations of um, associated plants, such as nectar sources, and um, even having things such as like the presence of deer and sheep on these clear fell sites. It um, will also co combat scrub invasion and allow new plants to grow in and allow for a different age vegetation to persist. Okay, so overall, the next steps would be to undertake the management that I've just outlined. Um, but however, we would want to monitor, monitor the modified sites for the butterfly, make sure that they are helping the area have more um, of the plants suitable for the butterfly, but also do butterfly counts in these areas to see whether or not they're moving into these spaces or not. Um, I've also outlined some future studies that could be um, taken out. So we could investigate the biodiversity of clear felling techniques in the west of Scotland, um, taking into account the economic benefit for foresters, as well as modelling optimal herbivore impact um, in these kind of areas and seeing how much sheep would be, or sheep or deer or anything, would be the best for opening up the 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 uh, areas enough to kind of get more scrub away from new plants to grow in or that kind of thing. Um, however, if it's deemed ineffective that this that we can't manage these uh, clear fell sites for the butterfly checker skipper um, beneficially, then I think we should reduce the widespread clear felling in the range of the checker skipper. So just a little thank you to Patrick Cook for helping me with, um, he was one of my supervisors for, um, from Butterfly Conservation. He helped me with identifying loads of plants in my first week of fieldwork, I kept on emailing loads of photos. And he also helped me with making my fieldwork plan and uh, reviewing my drafts. And he's helping me try to um, publish my dissertation just now, so thank you. And also to Butterfly Conservation Highland Branch and Pete Moore, for offering me funds to help me complete my field work for uh, staying up in Fort William for a couple of weeks last year. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Erin. That was a really great project, lovely presentation, and your photos of field work just made me <laughs> long for summer despite the mid -days. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, where did you study and what was your degree? Oh, and um, the question is where I studied and what my degree is. So I study at the University of Aberdeen and I'm doing zoology and I'm just finishing up my fourth year now. Okay. And were you interested in butterflies before you took this project on or was this a new venture? Um, I was quite interested in butterflies since um, just kind of starting my degree. I did a, a little fieldwork job over the past couple of summers um, for like a consultancy. Um, so then I kind of started learning how to identify butterflies and then I started learning how to identify moths and I started learning how to identify plants and I got really into identifying things. So I think that's kind of where my love kind of first came from. And then um, kind of late 2022, there was emails coming around from butterfly conservation with different projects and um, for students. And it was really great because there was like, you have your own supervisor from the university, but you also have members of staff within BC which are also like helping you and I could also get um, kind of helping get data from different organizations and stuff to help me plan my field work um, and it's also great and um, kind of getting to know the company and stuff and now I help out with some of the volunteer days and things so it's been a great experience altogether. Oh. That's what we like to hear. Yeah. No escaping now. No. <laughs> that was their one. So in 10 years time you'll be hosting them. Oh great. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a nice lunch break. So in this session, we're going to be hearing a lot about engagement and butterfly monitoring. But first up, we have a talk about species on the edge. Um, unfortunately, Liz can't make it over today. She does live on Mull, so it's a bit of a trek for her to come across here. So she's pre-recorded um, a presentation for us, which Fingers crossed the technology is going to work. I'm going to hand over. Hello, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the gathering. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, um, but I'm 
I very much hope you enjoy the following presentation about the Species on the Edge project in Argyll and the Inner Hebrides. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, the programme itself, uh, what we've achieved during year one and uh, our plans for year two and going forward. Um, so the, the programme itself is um, a Scotland-wide programme. It's got eight different partners involved and it's funded through the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, I work in the Argyll and Inner Hebrides area and you can see from this slide that there are seven different landscape scale project areas. Um, butterfly conservation covers uh, four of these, Argyll and the Inner Hebrides. Uh, Tracy covers the East Scotland coast area and we also do some work in Solway and on the north coast. We have uh, 37 target species across the partners and 19 of these are in Argyll and the Inner Hebrides. The programme itself is very wide ranging. It's very ambitious. Uh, it runs for four years and it includes all of the following types of activity. So we have surveying and monitoring across all the target species. We have habitat surveys and land management. Uh, we also give advice to landowners and provide training. Uh, some of my work involves actual capital work. So we have small budgets for things like uh, fencing and scrub clearance. Uh, we, one of the legacy uh, agendas of this project is volunteer recruitment, training and engagement. We hope that over the four years of this program that we can we can leave behind a team of active, engaged and uh, willing volunteers to take some of the work forward in the future. And through through that, we have a massive um, amount of people engagement, which includes anything from training volunteers through uh, what they call nature con connectedness, which is about um, encouraging people who don't necessarily currently engage with nature because for all sorts of reasons to um, perhaps have a go and uh, find out a little bit more about the species. We do lots of talks and events and activities. So our gal in the Inner Hebrides as, as an, a project area uh, is, um, as you can imagine, a very diverse and, and large landscape to work in. It runs from Sky in the north all the way down to Isla and uh, the Mullingan Tire in the south. Um, I'm based on Mull and um, the focus is, as you can see, a brighter future for rich herb, herb rich pastures. Um, quite a, a fancy title. Basically, um, I have two very important uh, species to look after with a four, four subspecies of burnet. So we have the slender scotch burnet, which is only found on mull and uh, ulver. The transparent burnet, which is more widely spread, it's found on the Argyll coast and on a number of, of the islands as well as, as mull. Uh, the talisker burnet is only found on sky. And the new forest burnet is, we just have one colony now on the Ardamurkan Peninsula. I also uh, arranged and ma managed the work for the marsh fertility, um, focused mostly on, on mull and uh, the Argyle mainland. And uh, it's quite a, a challenging area to cover, as you can imagine, which is why uh, we're very interested in recruiting lots more volunteers. So we're now starting the second year of the programme. So I just thought I'd share with you some highlights from the first year. Um, I started the post in, in January uh, 2023, and I've had just over 12 months in post. Um, so we had a, a, a great first year. We did we actually achieved quite a lot on the ground, as well as me settling in and learning about the programme and finding my feet and recruiting volunteers. So here we have a, a, a group of uh, very willing volunteers. I'm sure you'll recognise quite a few faces there. We did a three day residential on the Isle of Ulver, which is off the west coast of Mull, uh, looking for slender scotch burnet 
as well as transparent burnets. The, the island itself is community owned and they're very interested in managing the, the land to enhance any uh, rare or unusual species they might have, including obviously the burnets. Um, the group went over there for three days, a uh, bit of a planes, trains and automobiles experience. So you've got to get the, the ferry to Mole and then drive across Mole and then get another ferry to Ulva. Uh, the site itself is on the far side of Ulva. There are no roads, just, just tracks. Um, so the easiest route was to take everyone around by boat, to drop them off for the day and pick them up again in the evening. Uh, we split the area into kilometer squares and divided the teams up into two or three people and everyone has got got two or three kilometers to uh, to walk backwards and forwards looking for uh, looking for burnets and you'll be very pleased to know that we did find some it was slightly towards the end of the season because we had a very hot spring um but we did still still find some which was wonderful to see um other highlights from year one included uh, for me uh, the, my first sighting of slender scotch burnet caterpillars found these at a site called Langer Mull on Mull, which is um, the site itself is actually almost in someone's front garden, but it's very nice. And I went, he rang me to say he'd seen his first caterpillars, did I want to go down and have a look, which was like, uh, I think it was the very first few days of May last year. So I hot fussed it down there uh, and took, took some pictures and a little video and it was wonderful to see them. Uh, to help preserve their habitat down there, we've put in this new shiny uh, fence and gate, which will allow the landowner to uh, to manage the times at which the, the area is grazed and uh, stop his two donkeys from, uh, from eating everything in sight. Other highlights throughout the year as we progressed included um, uh, you'll see from the very dark picture in the bottom left hand side, that was July on Sky. Uh, you can never tell what the weather's going to be like. Uh, the middle of July, I went to Sky to meet my counterpart from Bat Conservation, who, who works there and uh, look for the Talisca Burnett. The weather was appalling. This was actually the best part of the day. It poured with rain, it was very cold and windy, and you would think it was the middle of winter. Uh, unfortunately, because of that, we didn't see any Talisca burnet, but we did see uh, a transparent hanging around it at the top of the vegetation in the rain as they as they like to do. Um, work is progressing with the Talisca and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. As the year progressed, we went into uh, full events and talks mode and I took the took the roadshow to three agricultural shows last year, um, two on Mull and one on the mainland to shout about the programme and to encourage more people to, to find out more and be involved and we'll be doing get that again this year. And then as we got into late August and September, it was marsh fertility counting time. So we did a, a whole series of training events and in field practice for a group of volunteers who are going to be doing a lot more of the monitoring as the year goes on and you can see them here i think that's actually craig new york golf course that's the rough area at craig new york golf course and we found lots of marsh fertility webs there which was great to see so looking forward to this year i've worked hard all all winter to put forward a, a program of activity and do quite a lot of planning and um, we, I feel like we've, we're really sort of starting to gear up in delivery now. So as far as surveying and monitoring goes, um, we are having a, an annual, the annual monitoring of known species sites. Uh, last year, we, we developed some new transect lines at Glengorm, Calgary Bay and Craig Dewar, as well as repeating existing established ones. We'll be surveying historic record sites to check on their status and inform any future work we want to do or might need doing, particularly around habitat management. Um, going back to Sky, I've just um, sent out a tender for um, a contract to, to, let, to have someone do the survey sites for the Talisker Burnett. We have a, a number of sites all down the, down the coastline of Sky um, where 
we have records of, of the Burnett colonies and we are hoping that we can find a adventurous soul to go out and uh, do some survey work for us, which will give us a, a good indication of, of how the Burnett is doing on Sky and whether we need to have any intervention work for their habitat. And the final thing uh, in this area is uh, we need to do some habitat monitoring at known sites. So we have uh, come up with our a method which we think will be suitable for both slender scotch burnet, transparent burnet and marsh matillary. And uh, David Hill and I will be trialling the, this this year with the idea of rolling it out in year three. Looking forward to some habitat management work. Uh, we, had a, we had a work party um, last weekend over near near Apid, which is on the Argyle coastline, um, which was great. We had uh, eight or nine volunteers came out to help do some scrub removal on a marsh fertility site. We have two more planned for uh, early spring, at both at Slender Scotch Burnett sites on Mull to remove uh, Catoniaster and scrub and some bracken in April and May. I, also looking at a site at Glengall Castle to put a new fence up with hope that the this will encourage, uh, well, it will help to manage the grazing and then hopefully encourage uh, the adjacent colonies to, uh, to move into new habitat. We're also looking at trialling uh, the idea of no fence collars. These are the uh, radio, the, the phone signal collars that you put on cattle and they're, they're uh, sort of use, you use an app on the phone to, to set a, an area that you want the cattle to graze in and this, this stops them from moving too far from where you want them to be. Uh, we're, we're going to trial that in uh, on the Isle of Ulva to control the bracken, um, but it's subject to funding. We're waiting to hear whether we've uh, been successful with our funding bid. But fingers crossed that will that will go forward this year. And then um, a scrub clearance, um, probably, possibly a contract, but maybe some volunteer involvement as well at the Scoble Triangle, which is near the Berg on the Ross of Mull, uh, habitat management for slender scotch and transparent burnets. And then the people engagement uh, part of the, of the work, um, following on from last year, plenty of one-to-one uh, -one landowner advice and training. Um, I, I've been going out meeting land managers and, and crofters and talking about the, the best way that they can manage the habitat for the species and also giving some um, training on how to identify what they have on their land. Um, we do lots of volunteer ID training and sur survey, survey techniques. Uh, we have two coming up in June. One is, is for transparent burnets and as part of the wider species on the edge programme, which obviously includes more, more species than just uh, moths and butterflies, um, I'm doing with my colleague from Bug Life uh, some training around northern Kalitis bees, uh, which we hope to find down on the Ross of Mull. They like quite um, sandy, sand dune type habitat. As part of the wider um, people engagement to to encourage more people who wouldn't necessarily want to come out and count things but uh, are interested in nature generally, we've uh, arranged four creative events. Um, one of which has been uh, very kindly run by Apithene, and that's in in early June. Nature journaling, where she's going to come along and take a group and talk about. Uh, how you can record what you see in a, in a creative way. We also have two creative writing sessions, one by a, a local lady on Mull, and uh, in July we'll be doing some willow weaving of um, insects like bees and butterflies, uh, again, run by a local lady, and that will be um, in July. There's a whole range of talks and events. So I've put together various slideshows depending on who I'm talking to. And uh, the first one's in, in May for the, the Mole Wildlife Group, where we'll we'll do a talk about the project and my particular species. 
um, but also set a moth trap overnight and then do a, an ID session the next day. Um, I'll be going to two or three shows again this year. Uh, we're just deciding which ones. I'll try and vary it because there's more than just the, the same three from last year. So I'll try and uh, I'll try and go to some new places as well. And um, finally, part of the wider Species on the Edge programme is um, the development of a youth panel. And we've had well, one very keen uh, young person from Mull who's managed to secure a place on that youth panel. And she is very keen to get involved. So I'll be supporting her through uh, the delivery of her own local project and also getting her involved in any volunteering opportunities with myself and uh, the volunteers here on Mull. How can you help us? We really need lots and lots of help with this programme. The more volunteers we can recruit, the better. Um, so the first thing you could do is you could join us as a work party. Um, we have two more coming up in the spring. If you ever find yourself on Mull and you're interested in being part of, of what we do, please do do not hesitate to get in touch. Um, I'm very, very happy to talk to anybody about what I'm doing and, and share some some of our wonderful landscapes with you. So we have um, the first one is actually scrub removal at Kilninian, which is a, a part of the Toloiski state on the west coast of, of Mull. This is a, a lovely slender Scotch brunette site. Uh, quite exposed as you can see it's the, it's literally a tiny little path around the edge of the the cliff great for spotting other wildlife as well as uh, lots of uh, burnets we are going to be removing cotoneaster and scrub and probably a bit of brash back and bracken bashing it's quite hard to say um this will be two days in april anybody's interested and then later in may uh, more bracken control at the Berg, which is a National Trust uh, managed property. You can see the far large round lump in the in the picture. That is that is what we call the Berg, and uh, it's a, a very important site for uh, slender scotch. And we have we've had many years of monitoring through the National Trust ranger there. So we're having a day helping her control the bracken on site. Uh, another way to get involved is to come and volunteer to survey or monitor a site for us. Uh, in particular, this year we're asking for people to uh, volunteer to go and find a uh, historic site that we have and just to see if the species are still there. Um, so if you fancy a trip to Argyll or the Inner Hebrides or you come in here on holiday and you, you fancy having a little wander out to one of our sites, please do get in touch. We have a whole list of good references and uh, advice that we can give about how to get to some of the sites. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And if you're not too sure about um, IDing some of the, the species, we're particularly looking at transparent burnet and marsh fertility this year. Transparent burnets fly in June, and we have a ID training course um, one day, in on the 14th of June, we haven't quite determined a site yet, but that will be somewhere on the Argyle mainland. And uh, later on in the year, we'll, we'll be doing some ID training on marsh fertility. So if you've got a spare few days or you just fancy a trip, please do get in touch with us. And then the, the, finally, the, the, the other area where I often welcome a lot of help is, is actually at the shows events and talks and things where it's always it's always great to have more than one person to help set things up and chat to people uh, you sometimes get a crowd and you, it's hard to get around and make sure everyone's had a chance to ask their questions and it means you get a day out with the agricultural show you get to look at the the livestock and watch the judging uh, there's always a pipe band which is uh, it was great to see and plenty of uh, local produce and food to buy if you're interested in, in being involved or you just want to find out a bit more about the, the program, please do get in, in touch. Uh, there's my email address and my telephone number. The information about any volunteering opportunities will also be available on the BC webpage. 
and our new volunteer portal. So if you haven't joined the portal yet, please do sign up and uh, we'll be able to send you opportunities and emails about what we're doing in the future. Thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the day. So up next, we have a newer staff member, Alice Kenny. I think this is her first talk here, is that? Yep, she's going to be telling us all about Wild Spaces, Perth and Stirling. So welcome, Alice. Hey, yeah, so as Bethany says, I'm new to BC. Oh, well, I feel like I'm not really new now, but seeing everyone here, I'm like, I don't know anyone. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still very new. Um, So yeah, I joined in um very very end of may start of um june and on the perth and sterling world spaces project and it's been a journey it's been a lovely journey it's been very enjoyable um yeah but it's, it's a constant learning for us so it's yeah it's been pretty good um so a little bit about um world spaces if we don't know it um we've actually got some kind of little updates but i might actually just jump back to kind of what Wild Spaces is. So Wild Spaces is about engaging those kind of most disengaged with nature and um, trying to capture them, get them involved in doing something because doing something is better than doing nothing and, and just to kind of empower people to feel like they can they can get involved, they can learn something new and they can just enjoy being outside thinking about butterflies and moths. Um, so kind of what we've been up to um, we have lots of resources. I think some people might have joined some of the branch updates and things that Steve um, delivered for us, but we're getting more and more resources, basically. And um, we're always trying to get new things, but we kind of would ask that if there was anything in particular that would be useful for you, that you let us know and we can kind of make something up that way. Um, so we can actually up that number a little bit as well. Um, we're getting more and more world spaces and where the world spaces are popping up are kind of becoming more varied um, to community groups, to people's gardens, to schools, which is excellent. That's exactly what we want. We want all these kind of different spaces to have a big kind of wide showcase. Um, so a couple of other updates. We have a very small team for wild spaces. There's three of us. So there's only a few of us. Um, so as much help as possible is ideal. So myself and Perth and Sterling, and then we have Angus in our Bristol and Western project as well, which focuses on schools. Um, and one of the great things about the Wild Spaces kind of project aspect is that we can make it targeted to areas. So we can offer Wild Space projects the best suit the areas, um, to give us the best outcomes, ideal. Lots of new resources on the go. So if you pop onto the Wild Spaces website, you'll hear my very annoying central belt accent. Um, and you can watch some lovely videos that just make you feel nice and happy because there's lots of pretty flowers um, and lots of lovely butterflies and moths. So I would recommend if you've not seen it, go on and have a little look because it's it's really lovely. It's just a lovely resource. Um, and we have our toolkits and um, new messaging and things to go out. We've got some lovely post posters um, booklets, postcards and things to um, hand out to people um, which yeah you can let me know if you need any, we have lots and lots of them so if you want any resources for Wild Spaces please do let me know and I can get some out to you. Um, so what have we been up to? And um, We've got 20 new sites created which might not seem like a lot um, but that, that feels very impressive to me <laughs> you know 20 new spaces since um, since June is is brilliant when you actually look at it like that. And these are very varied spaces as well um, that I'll talk a little bit more about kind of how, the, how we've tried to kind of vary them up. Um, we've had 31 engagement activities, um, which look very different. I've had a lot of cake over summer, a lot of cake over winter, and and there will be more cake, um, but cake works. So if you take anything away, if you want engagement, bring some cake. Um, we can up this number even more. Um, so this was our kind of end of January number for people taking part in Wild Spaces project, which was a whole range of different activities. So it might have been some of the engagement activities. It may have been coming out and supporting the Wild Space creation. Um, it may have been coming to some of the talks. It may have been coming to some of the workshops, just anything and everything. Um, but this week alone, we could probably add up another 80 people um, from a couple of more um, engagement activities. 
some of our big highlights have been working with community development workers within local areas to really, really target those areas who have the most disconnect with nature. Um, and those have been really useful, useful engagement activities. So we've had a couple this week, um, which have been really enjoyable. And yeah, people who've never heard of us before coming along and kind of chatting to us, which has been really lovely. And every one of those activities leads to another engagement activity, which is ideal. Someone comes along and they, they chat to us about a space they've got or they want to talk about just how do they get people out and about, um, which is ideal because it just leads to more and more activities. Um, yeah, so a slight different approach, um, I guess, um, where I've kind of just gone out and been annoying um, was the best way that I can describe my kind of wild spaces personality. Um, just going out and just joining people at every chance I can get into. Um, so working with community development officers who work with those most disengaged communities. Um, so if I'm popping into a community, I'm brand new, but some of these community development workers have been in there 10 years. Um, so it makes them so much more sense if I go and piggyback on what they're already doing and kind of just join in with their activities. Um, but that leads to new wild spaces. That leads to people taking away wild space packs so they can make their own new wild spaces. Um, so yeah, great way to kind of deliver that aspect. Um, one of the other um, target audiences we've got um, for the project is a younger audience. So trying to get that youth audience in, get that new generation in, think about birth as moths. Um, so again, we've done that a couple of different ways between Stirling and um, Perth. The Stirling has some climate ambassadors who have taken on a brilliant role for us. We went out, done some moth mornings with them. We've done some just general ID walks and they have decided that their school grounds are terrible and they are going to create all these new wild spaces in their school ground, which is fantastic because one person, I couldn't do that, but six or seven people within each of the schools going out and taking on that, that work is ideal. Um, and they will also then feed that through to the rest of their school. And um, so they're going to take some resources through to the rest of the school. Um, and a lot of the Perth schools are taking on more rural skills work. So we've been trying to work with some of those high schools to just support what they're already doing, just give them some extra resources, some extra bits and pieces that they can get out and about and use. Um, and then trying to offer some activities for some of the climate ambassadors across the council side. So some ID workshops, just some, some gardening workshops and things just to keep it fun and light, but just get you thinking about wild spaces. Um, the where we've selected our sites are quite visible. So if anyone drove into Perth today, hopefully in summer, if you drive back in, um, you'll see some of our lovely sites that are um, getting a bit more colourful and a bit more varied than they have been, um, which is lovely. So working with the council on some of those, um, some of the sites are previously kind of disowned sites that, you know, they just look a bit drab. So we've been trying to work with communities to have something that they feel a bit more connected to. So they kind of think about nature as they're walking past. Um, and yeah, working with um, the councils to try and support what they're already doing within their work. Um, and some of that has been the engagement element for it. Um, kind of lots of, lots of chatting um, as I've been going out and doing workshops. I seem to tend to do none of the work um, on, a, on a work party day. I tend to just stand and chat to people. Um, which feels a little bit lazy, but has been brilliant because these have been spaces that people appeared, you know, the, the, the space appeared, people didn't feel connected to it. But if I'm just there and I have a presence and they've seen me as something else and then they see me going out to plant stuff has made a big difference. So from a space that they've kind of not wanted or had said, you know, we don't want this space left, we don't want this space um, as a meadow, but I'm there, so that makes a big difference for them because then they get to chat to me. Um, and then sometimes I've actually kind of joined in and um, planted a couple of things or taken stuff away with them as well, which is ideal. I'd like people to do that as well. So that's been a great way to um, connect people to spaces and just make them feel a bit more, a bit more engaged with it, just a bit of ownership over the space and um, the work that's been put into the area. Um, what are we doing next? Um, promoting wild spaces at every opportunity. Um, wherever I go I will chat about it and I tend to be most places if there's any community element I tend to find a way to be there. Um, we've got more wild space campaigns coming up um, and we're going to try and vary these and see how they look different 
um, to, for different audiences to try and just really target people. Um, and yeah, work on more flagship projects. So currently there's myself and Angus going out, but it'd be great to have more people going out and actually delivering these activities. Um, and more work on our um, website. There's, I guess there's three things. If you take anything away today, there's three big asks that I've got for you. It's to just go out and talk about wild species because I'm only one person. So if you can all chat about it, that is a massive help for me. Um, the other would be to add any wild species that you have existing, that you know of, please add them because any space can be a wild space, really. Just let us know what's been happening. And then the third thing is if you can um, let me know if you've got any lovely gardens or spaces and you want to kind of have them as little features for the case study for the website, um, that would be excellent. Um, yeah. <laughs> any questions? <laughs> Sounds like your summer is very hard. Planting lots of plug plants. Lots of plug plants, lots of seeds going in, absolutely. Great. And have you been getting the volunteers to help grow the plug plants or is that is that the next? Um we've kind of had a little bit of a mix and match with this actually. So we've got a good healthy budget for plug plants so we have been buying a lot but some of our community gardens that have been taken part that have created some of the wild space workshops have actually brought on some things for us so that's their next level of engagement so they've started with us going in and kind of giving them a space or you know giving them some advice but they, a few gardens have actually kind of taken that on for us um, and have been really kind and you know donating little bits of space within their community gardens where we don't have a lot of space to bring them on they've been yeah really really brilliant and that's their next level of engagement it just helps them feel better connected to the project as well any questions in the room for alice <laughs> yeah absolutely it would be lovely to get those spaces across Aberdeen as well on on the website just to showcase people because i think that's what people don't often realize a space could be a wild space they have it in their mind that it must be a meadow but actually it could be anything and everything you know there could be any any variation but yeah absolutely one of the things we've done um for some of the sites where we've got larger sites on rat block in particular we've got one very very big site um and people were a bit unsure about what this is going to look like so it was going to be that that drab bit of long, long grass in the in the winter so we actually took the school groups out because that was one of the easiest ways to target the whole community and we done lots and lots of games world space games with them and that had a, a really lovely impact because we couldn't the space was too big to kind of highlight or you know put a fence around or anything like that people use it all the time um but we, we, we when we were there we just kind of took that approach where myself and the the community gardening group in the school went out the kids made up some games I gave them games as well and then the kids made some up and then all of a sudden people were stopping and asking and actually were quite happy that this was happening because they we just took the time to kind of chat about it and just say this is why it's going to look a little bit drab but actually it's a lovely space even in the winter and you can use it for all these lovely activities. Great thank you Alice. Next up we're moving on to butterfly recording and we have a uh, special guest. <laughs> uh, Rachel Conway is going to talk about the Garden Butterfly Survey results. Hello everybody, I'm Rachel Conway, Butterfly Monitoring Officer for Butterfly Conservation and my main role is actually supporting the volunteers who survey under the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to sneak in a little bit of uh, feedback from that too at the start of my presentation. So while Santa sets me up, oh, there we go. There are we for on. Okay, lovely. Thanks very much. So my big takeaway today was actually from Aaron's talk, which is if you want to get a laugh out of your audience, put a photograph of your sandwiches up. I mean, that got a great laugh. That was really good. There was quite a lot of discussion had already about what's best to partner your peanut butter with. Is it raspberry or apricot jam? So that's good. Um, so thanks for having me. I'm normally stuck in a garret in Northern Ireland. Uh, working by myself so it's really nice to be over here with some human beings and in such a nice part of the world which I haven't been to before so that's lovely and um, so I'm going to give you a reader's digest of the UK BMS and also then um, the garden butterfly survey 
So I'm going to talk to you first of all about standard transects. So these are the transects that are walked 26 weeks of the year. And the transect coverage in Scotland has been absolutely fantastic. You can see here over the last 10 years, we've almost doubled the number of transects that you have in Scotland and made a fantastic recovery following um, COVID. And I know from my inbox that um, there's a great deal of work um, undertaken by surveyors and their local coordinators and staff to increase that coverage. The red dots here on the right are um, transects that were walked in 2023. And the grey dots are transects that weren't walked last year or haven't been walked for some years. So if you see a dot near you and you think and you might be interested in surveying it, then please do um, let me know because they, we could pick up some of those transects again. So some highlights from the transects. So all of these um, transects here are sites which have got more than 25 years um, of data. So data runs of 25 years or more. So that is absolutely fantastic. These are the kind of sites that we want to celebrate next year when we celebrate 50 years of the UK BMS. And we'd like to host some events around the whole of the UK. And we're looking for um, people who are involved with sites that are special in terms of their long data runs like this or have specialist habitats or species. And we can arrange some local events where people can come and see some of the fantastic work that's been doing that's been going on with um, surveying and monitoring. So for 2023, there was 150 transect sites walked um, with 2,767 visits conducted. So uh, almost 51,000 butterflies recorded of 33 species. Yep. So meadow brown um, was the most recorded species on the UK BMS last year with 11,500 nearly um, records submitted. Ringlet was the second most recorded species, 7,500 records. And green-veined white was the third most recorded species with almost 4,000 records. There was one species which um, made the species list 33 rather than 32 species for the whole of the data set. Does anyone know what that might be? It was recorded on the 12th of September from Ken D. Marshes. Is that recorder here? No, it's purple hair streak. One record. <laughs> <laughs> so onto the wider countryside butterfly survey. So this is a survey that we undertake in um, across the wider countryside. And it's really to try and gather uh, butterfly data and understand what's happening to butterflies outside of those good habitats um, where transect sites tend to be located. So habitats um, that are quality habitats or sites, um, nature reserves are located, et cetera. So it's a bit of a declining picture here in Scotland for coverage for the wider countryside butterfly survey. We had a bit of a dip and then kind of stabilized after COVID. And um, I used to be responsible for sort of promoting and delivering this survey in Northern Ireland, and it's really not an easy sell at all. So I totally empathise with all of the champions who do their very best to even maintain coverage with this scheme. Um, you can see there's lots of opportunity in the green sites are available sites and the red sites are sites that were walked in 2023. But what it, you know, whilst it looks like it's quite a nice place to go and walk, because of the random stratification of the squares that are available, you can get there and there can be lots of different challenges such as, um, you know, livestock and landowners and access problems. So it really is a difficult survey to, to sort of maintain. And last year, rain was the key theme of the wider countryside butterfly survey. It was very, very wet for everyone. In Northern Ireland, it was the wettest July ever on record. And, um, and so, you know, this coverage is dipped across the whole of the UK. So don't be too disappointed. But we should um, celebrate the, the gains. So Glasgow and South West Scotland added two squares to their coverage this year. So well done there. And Highland also added two squares. Um, unfortunately, East Scotland uh, would lost four. But in what was a bad year for everyone, I'm not too um, worried about that. And they have also can boast some very long data runs with the wider countryside butterfly survey. So some results from the survey. It was 48 squares visited in total in Scotland. 
from 109 visits, returning just around two and a half thousand butterflies. A really nice result was that holly blue was recorded for the first time on a square at Woodhaven um, at New Portland Hay. Um, so the analysis of the wider countryside butterfly survey is an occupancy report. Um, so we have a look at what species were seen in which square. And green veined white knocked ringlet off the top spot from last year. And it was found in 82% of the squares. I should just probably explain that we, we, we based the analysis on a square on a visit conducted in July and again in August, separated by 10 days. So at, that actually wasn't the full 48 squares, that was 22 squares that we could conduct the analysis on. Um, so green veined white in 82% of the squares, up 24% on last year. Ringlet in 72% of the squares, up 15% from last year. And meadow brown in 69% of the squares, up 14% from last year. So quite a good year there for occupancy. And you can also uh, record moths and dragonflies on your wider countryside butterfly survey. So there was 31 moth species recorded in Scotland. And in terms of just abundance, it was silver wise, silver ground carpet and common carpet in that order that was recorded. And you can also record your dragonflies and damselflies. And 12 different species were recorded with common daughter being the most um, frequently reported. Just gonna take a little bit of water. So these are squares with long runs. These are really great squares here. And you can see that East Scotland have done really well um, to have uh, these years, these squares with such a long data run. And I was chatting to Richard earlier and I thought maybe one of these squares was Richard's. Richard, do you think that is your square still here? Very good, congratulations, well done. And um, and there we've got a, a run of 16 years as well in the Highlands and Islands. So I don't know if that recorder is here, but well done to you. That's a fantastic data run as well. So we do have some squares um, which have long data runs, but they haven't been recorded for two or three years. We'd really like to get those up and running. So you see those squares, if they're anywhere near you, that would be, um, and you'd be interested in taking a look at those, then please do get in touch. This one here, 9H9216 is actually Avonmore. It's a mapped square. It looks like it's over quite a nice habitat. And it's just north uh, west of Ave northeast, sorry, of Avonmore there. And that one's free. It's not been walked for two or three years. So if that's your holiday destination, if you if you travel up there for a trip, it'd be really nice to um get that covered. So we do have the holiday squares element of um the wider countryside survey, which is we were trying to get some um, records in these squares that are in remote places where not very many people live. So it's really hard to get coverage. And you can go and do a one-off survey of these squares. So you can look up on our holiday squares map and you can find a square that might be near your holiday destination and you can just go and record it the once. It's a really nice way to, to introduce yourself into the UK BMS because there's no ongoing commitment. You can give it a try. And um, if you want to keep visiting it year after year, you can, but if you don't want to, that's fine. So if you go onto the map um, on the UK BMS website, if you go onto the page holiday squares, this is where you'll find the map. Green squares are those that are taken, but I, I wouldn't kind of um, go by that because you'd have to unselect yourself as a walker and quite frequently people don't. So if you see any square on that map that you'd be interested in, just let me know and I'll check whether it's free for you. I quite fancy a retirement exercise of going around and getting data in all of those squares, actually, that would be a nice road trip. Okay, so on to the garden butterfly survey now. And the reason I'm talking about the garden butterfly survey is it's not actually part of my role anymore, but I was involved in the revamp in 2022. Survey has been running since 2016, citizen science project based in gardens. And we had a revamp in 2022 and we set up a new website and it had some new data visuals and new types of gardens. So previously it was just like a privately owned garden and you now can add um, an allotment or a balcony or a yard with pots, shared garden or community garden. And we asked some new questions and that's because we want to do some new research with the data that we gather. And I'm gonna to talk to you in, in a minute or two about some of the research that we have undertaken. Some of the questions that we ask within the garden butterfly survey is, do you have flowering ivy in your garden? Do you set aside an area for long grass? 
do you plant um, plants or allow plants to grow that specifically for caterpillars? And do you use pesticides, that kind of thing? So we've had some, some of the questions been in existence from 2016, which we've done some research on, and we've asked some new questions because we want to do some more research in the future so that we can properly you know, find out what's the best way to support butterflies through gardens. So the Garden Butterfly, and Surve um, the Garden Butterfly Survey in Scotland, we've had a bit of a dip from 2022 when 84 gardens took part down to 58 this year but I'm hoping that is down to just the really wet summer that we had I know in Northern Ireland where I live it, it was you know I hardly saw any butterflies in the garden so please do join in this year and we'll try and bump the numbers up again so it's just over 5,000 butterflies were seen of 50 uh, sorry of 20 species um, the most reported species were um, red admiral and peacock and small white. And the Red Ad Admiral actually made up 40% of all the records that came in um, through the Garden Butterfly Survey this year. Ooh. And we also do an occupancy study for the Garden Butterfly Survey, and Red Admiral also led the board in terms of red occupants. Um, re the Red Admiral also um, led the board in terms of occupancy for the Garden Butterfly Survey. So it was found in 80% of gardens. Peacock came in second. That was found in 67% of gardens. And the small tortoiseshell came in um, in third in 67% of gardens as well. I had to check the data twice this morning when I saw that I'd repeated that. And it's actually true. Um, so that there's the small tortoiseshell, not the small white, out of third position in terms of occupancy, but small white did come in fourth at around 53% occupancy. So some highlights from Scotland for the Garden Butterfly Survey. The most butterflies recorded overall were at, uh, from a garden near Chapleton, Newton Hill. So if you're here today, thanks very much for your efforts. You actually contributed 20% of 26% uh, of all the records. Well done. The most species were found at Garden near Collinsboro in Fiveshire, with 14 species. Very good. And the first and last record of the year, this was really quite impressive that we were able to achieve this, was from the same garden. And that was a garden at Tully Nestle in South Aberdeenshire. And we saw a peacock on the 13th of February and a red admiral on the 15th of November. Go back a minute. So, um, I'm going to introduce you now to some research that's been undertaken by the um, monitoring and recording team and also by the ecology team. Um, this is not my research, so please don't ask me any difficult questions, okay? So I'm going to present it to you, and if there's any difficult questions, I'll make a note of those and I'll ask the people who wrote it. So it's been written by um, Elizabeth Hordley, who's part of the Scotland team, and um, postdoctoral researcher, and Richard Fox, who's head of science. So one of the questions was, does having long grass in gardens increase butterfly abundance and richness? And we did find that um, having long grass increases butterfly abundance by about eight butterflies, and that it increases species richness by about 2%. We found that these changes were driven mostly by uh, butterflies that use grasses as their larval food plants such as speckled wood, ringlet, meadow brown, skippers, etc. We asked, does having more long grass in gardens increase butterfly abundance and richness? And we found that we went up from five meters squared to 400 meters squared, there was an increase of about 50 butterflies seen and that there was an increase of about 7% um, in richness. And I think this is really nice kind of reassurance and, and, and links in quite nicely with wild spaces as well, is that I think sometimes when we can do set aside areas, we can be under a bit of pressure to get like, you know, flower rich areas developed. And actually we can see that just having set aside grass area is really important. And, um, you know, you shouldn't be feel under any pressure to get the species rich flower area in there. And you'd, you're not failing if you don't get all those lovely orchids in within three years. So, so grasses are good. Speaking from experience there. We also asked, does having flower and ivy in gardens increase autumn butterfly abundance and richness? And the answer was no. So that's really easy. 
Um, there was no significant difference in the abundance and richness of butterflies recorded in, aut in autumn with those um, gardens with the flowering ivory. However, there was an increase in the number of red admiral and there was an increase in the number of comma um, who are known to feed on um, flowering ivy in the autumn. And there was also an increase in the abundance of holly blue during the second generation um, when females are laying their eggs on the um, ivy flower. So I hope that little bit of summary of the garden butterfly survey has um, inspired you to take part. Um, I'm sure um, you are all set, if you have a garden, that you're setting aside a little area for butterflies anyway. Um, and um, I have uh, set aside an area of grass for my um, in my garden, and, and I'm really pleased now that that is beneficial for butterflies. But I've also been um, experimenting with a mini brownfield site. So when I moved into my garden, it there was a large area of uh, black stone, you know, like the kind you'd find in a forest ride, you know, that black stone, and it had been sprayed off for every year. And I just stopped uh, doing anything with it and let it just colonize. Um, and there's all sorts in there, and there's violets and um, yarrow and campion and fox and cubs and hawkbit and all kinds of lovely flowers. But I don't let any grass in that area at all. I always pull it out by hand. And I do have some livestock, some conservation livestock who helped me in that area of the garden. So I'm going to leave you with a little photograph of them um, while I sign off and say thank you very much. Okay, our final talk before we head off for a tea break is Chris Stamp, who's going to be talking about targeted recording for mapping species distribution. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a couple of recording projects um, in the in the East Scotland branch mostly. Um, these are these are projects which are really just for fun and interest in, in butterflies. Really, they didn't have a particular conservation um, target, but uh, one of the side effects was it just just got people very interested, you know, it's popular surveys that other people are keen to join in. So um, just raising awareness of butterflies, getting people more and in, more in, uh, involved in them, hopefully has an indirect conservation benefit just in terms of engagement. So, um, yeah, as I mentioned, it's kind of two, two different pro two different projects that I'm going to summarise. Um, how many people know what we're looking at here, just out of interest? Mm -hmm. Pretty good. <laughs> Good. Okay, so the two projects that I'm going to talk about are um, discovering purple hair streaks and tracking holly blue expansion on, on the northeast coast. Um, as I mentioned, they were purely for fun and curiosity and adding knowledge of these species. Um, okay, so you might have seen my presentations about purple hair streaks before. And I have, I've done a, done a few of them. So this is a rewind to a presentation that I did in May 2021. Um, yep. Yeah, so, so mid-2021, mid, mid 2021, I discovered that in my local area, um, purple hair streaks were actually much more common than, than I'd been led to believe. I'd been recording butterflies in that area for, for probably 10 years or more. Um, didn't Wasn't really aware of purple hair streaks other than at one site, uh, which we used to travel to each year to see them, uh, King Clavin Wood. But um, I, I decided to have a look around and to see if I could find any more. And, I, and to my surprise, I found that there were pretty much everywhere where there was an oak tree, I found purple hair streaks. So not, not only were they not a rare butterfly, they were probably the most common butterfly in the area once, once, I, knew what I, was, once I knew what I was looking for. So I was, I was really intrigued to find out whether that could be the case in the rest of Scotland. Um, so, so the map on the left here was the known distribution of purple hair streaks at that time. I did a presentation um, speculating on the potential actual distribution which is the which is the map on the right here? Um, so the the open circles. I was pretty confident we could find purple hair streaks here if people knew how to look for them. Um, the question marks were very speculative. No idea whether whether they could be there. There was some kind of hints from very historical records, but nothing nothing current. Um, so so yeah, I did that presentation. That was the start of basically an awareness uh, campaign for purple hair streaks, just to try to get people looking for them. Um, I wrote various newsletter articles, did, did more presentations online. Um, essentially wanted to make sure there was no escape from purple hair streaks. Wherever you were, whatever you were reading, whatever you were looking at, you would find out, you would hear about purple hair streaks of nagging people over time. So um, speculating in the, in the Borders newsletter that there might actually be a completely new species that nobody was seeing in the Scottish Borders. 
Um, and it was successful. Uh, if you look at um, the records in iRecord for purple hair streaks between 2015, 2019, 27 records, just over five records a year. Since I started nagging everybody, um, you can see 661 records in the last three years. And in terms of the map, this distribution map, this is the impact that we've had in the, in the last three years. The yellow dots here are new 10K squares um, that weren't previously recorded. So we, we've filled in a few of the blanks in, in, in the distribution, but the, the really notable thing is just the range, you know, the range increase there. Um, but uh, um, purple hair streaks up in D side for the first time ever, never been recorded up there. Even one up on space side, uh, one site there. And generally, you know, five, we covered, covered at least five, um, northern to the range in Persia and Angus, lots of new 10K squares. And down in um, down in the Lothians and the borders, they were they were kind of pretty much unknown down there. But we, we found them in in a lot of different areas. Um, so so yeah, in terms of the actual range in Scotland, a really big increase. Um, so I need to mention Carol Pudsey, who did a lot of the work around the north edge of the range. She's out pretty much every suitable evening on her electric bike, uh, targeting blank squares continuously for two or three years. So she, she added a lot of those yellow dots. Um, Gail and Jeff Ballinger down in the Lothians and Borders. Uh, you put your hands up, Gail and Jeff. Um, amazing results there, finding several new county records, not just 10K square records, but counties where they'd never been seen before. And in some areas that were pretty tough ones to crack where we weren't actually expecting to find them because it was you would think that if they were there, people would have recorded them. Um, but Gail and Jeff were very successful finding them in these new places. One thing to mention is the role of egg hunting in these surveys. Um, egg hunting was not something I'd ever done before. Uh, it felt like something that real specialists, real experts would do, not, not your kind of general recorders. So it's not something I'd, I'd experienced. Did manage to find a Purple Hair Street kind of by chance in, in our local village and, and kind of realised that it was possible. And you can see egg hunting has actually produced some of the really significant records here, um, uh, Patrick found the uh, eggs up at um, D-side, Patrick Cook, was Patrick here, up in the corner. Uh, that was an amazing find. He, he found purple hair streak eggs many miles outside the known purple hair streak range. And we had an unusual situation where we knew for sure that purple hair streaks were in D-side, but nobody had ever seen the butterfly. And so, so in, until the following July, that was the case. And the Scottish borders had some really big um, purple hair streak egg finds recently as well. Um, Epiphany here found a uh, purple hair streak egg after Storm Babette um, in an area well outside the known distribution of purple hair streaks. Sheila Sim found some in Duns in the border as well. So, um, so yeah, really interesting. And it, a lot of people do that now. A lot of people are familiar with egg hunting and uh, producing some, some really good records that way. Um, so if you're not familiar with purple hair streak egg hunting, there is a purple hair streak egg there on the oak twig. Um, so you need to be looking at the terminal buds, but the eggs are always laid at the base of the terminal buds. Um, so it's there. And a close-up, that's what they look like, very close-up. Um, so yeah, but they're just under one millimeter in size. So these these are these are two eggs that are in, in my fridge right now. Um, so, so what happens is if, we've obviously had a lot of winter storms uh, the last few years, um, which has brought down a lot of oak twigs, lots of branches, whole trees. You can find entire oak trees have come over. So that gives you a chance to go and look at the buds at the at the uh, tops of the trees to fi find the eggs. If you find them on a fallen branch or a fallen twig, those the caterpillars that live inside these eggs all winter would just die in the spring. When they're hatched, they would have nothing to eat. So there's nothing to lose by picking these up, taking them home and seeing if you can rear the butterfly yourself and reintroduce it back to, back to its habitat. Um, I have done presentations on rearing purple hair streaks, so I don't have time to do that now. Uh, but if anyone's interested in giving it a go or has, has some eggs they don't know what to do with or find some in the next few weeks, um, I can give you a presentation and some instructions on, on how to go about um, rearing um, purple hair streaks from eggs. This is a, a picture that I created based on taking photographs of each stage of the life cycle while rearing and combining them into one composite image along with the food plant to kind of show the whole life cycle. So there's even an egg, a little egg in the, in the middle around the buds and obviously the caterpillar, pupa and the adult butterflies. Uh, so, so what next in terms of surveying? Um, Lower D-side is a big target for us. We, we know that they're around Ballater and Dinnett area now. There's some fantastic 
Oakwoods in, in the Lower East Side, some of the best Oakwoods in East Scotland. So they really should be there, but we, we haven't had a lot of luck finding them yet. Um, so so we'd really like to learn more about whether they're, whether they're in that area. Um, Spearside, we've got one one site from Spearside. But presumably they can't just be in one site on Spearside. They must be scattered up and down the area. So we need some, some more surveys to find out where else they are. Uh, Lothians and Borders made some great progress already, but there's still some big blank areas, so we'd like to find out more. Um, Jeff's already made great progress finding some new sites in 2024 through egg surveys, like wasting no time at all. So yeah, more, pa more participants welcome, especially if you live in these areas. Um, please get in touch and we can suggest sites uh, to go. To go uh, look. Um, I'm covering the East Scotland branch area with this presentation, but um, the Highlands and Islands and Southwest are, are definitely worth looking at too. We did have some big uh, discoveries on the West Coast, even on the islands, so Mull and Isla, have purple hesterix for the first time ever, even in areas where there wasn't a lot of habitat. So just shows that they are actually quite widespread if you know how to look at them. So, so how did we manage to find, oops, sorry, how did you manage to find um, purple hesterix in these areas where you know, there's been butterfly experts and recorders living for decades and never found the purple hesterix? So, so why is that? Um, I don't think it's because the butterfly is expanding. I think it's purely awareness. The thing about purple hesterix is that um, you don't come across them when you're looking for other butterflies. Uh, you don't find them on transects. Transects completely miss purple hair streaks because they fly in the evening and because they're in the top of the trees. So anyone who goes out looking for purple hair streaks on a nice sunny day, they're not going to see them. You have to know how to find them. So that it's probably just under recording and lack of awareness that's that's uh, that's had this effect. Okay, we're not going to take questions on just now, so I'm going to move on to Holly Blues quickly, but we'll come back and I can answer questions um, separately. So um, so Holly Blues had a fantastic year in 2023, and I'd never seen Holly Blues in Scotland, so I was quite interested. They started to approach my area in, in South Perthshire. Um, they'd been seen in Fife. This is another of my composite photos, this time using pictures from, from Peter Eels. Um, Peter and myself are working on a project to create an image like this for every UK species, which is going to take a while, because we, not because we don't have pictures of the life cycle. Pete has all, all those, who, and you might have seen his book on on the um, the on the life cycles of butterflies. So he's got all the pictures, but uh, getting pictures of the food plants is is the challenge. We're going to have to grow grow plants and take pictures of them in order to have the full set. Um, so the northeast holly blue. So so Elspeth, uh, um, one of the, the the five recorders, reported on Facebook that um, two or three holly blues have been seen in Wormit and commented at the time that it was an extreme, extremely rare butterfly in Fife. Um, so it was within range of, it moved within range of, of where I live, so it wasn't too far away for me to check. So I went to Wormit in the spring to see if there was any sign of a persistent population. Um, and there was, I, I did find a few. It took, took a, a little bit of walking around the, the roads and streets to find them, um, but I was successful. The problem was most of the habitat was out of reach in in private gardens, I would see a butterfly come over a wall, try and chase it to get a photograph to prove that I had actually seen a holly blue, and then it would disappear back into the garden. Um, so I wasn't I wasn't about to start climbing over people's walls to uh, to get pictures of the butterflies. Um, so yeah, it was it was obviously going to be difficult to do a to do a proper survey. Um, but I posted what I found on Facebook and discovered that um, that Wendy Irons actually lives in Wormit. When I think Wendy's here, was where Wendy Wendy's down there. So. So we, we put together um, an idea for for trying to gather data from just from residents and gardens. So we put together some posters, a postcard survey. This is the, the postcard that we put together here. And also posted on just on the general Wormit community Facebook page, uh, requesting records from, from residents. Uh, we had no idea what to expect, really. We weren't targeting butterfly recorders. We were just general public. So just to see if we could get any, any information. Um, so the results. Uh, exceeded our expectations, as you can see here. Um, so every dot, every dot on there was a, was a record of a holly blue. Um, most of those came directly from a postcard survey. We would get scans of postcards or posted postcards back. Um, the ones that have black dots were accompanied by photographs to help with the identification. Uh, so we had over 40 records by the end of the year. Um, more than 30 different recorders sent records. Many of those people would be um, completely new to, to butterfly recording. 
Um, so we introduced a lot of people to, to the species and to the concept of butterfly recording. So hopefully raise some awareness and some interest. Um, if, if you if you go onto the to the Wormit uh, community Facebook group um, just now, you'll see a lot of people talking about Holly Blues who probably didn't know anything about butterflies at all before, and even evidence that people were visiting Wormit just to see the, the famous Wormit Holly Blues, <laughs> so kind of celebrity celebrity butterfly. Um, interesting data that we got in terms of the, the flight period. Uh, you, can, you can see the, the dates that the records were made on, on this graph. Um, the, the kind of glitch at the start, I'm guessing, was probably because of terrible weather during one week in, in spring is, is uh, not totally unexpected. I think that's probably what it was. We can see there's clearly um, two, two broods. Um, that's interesting because if you read reference the reference guides, you'll, you'll quite often read that holly blue is single brooded in the north of its range um but that's obviously not true you know we, we found it wasn't and it's probably one of those things that was somebody stated that in a book at one point and it's been repeated even even that's an error um paul kirkland's book on scottish butterflies does correctly say that holly Blue is double brooded um so how reliable were the results um so we, we gathered all this data some of it had photographs which obviously helps a lot a lot of it didn't, so we so we have to interpret you know, how reliable is this data that we're getting. I, I was quite confident that the, that the data is is reliable because we didn't get any photographs back of things that weren't holly blues. We didn't get any photographs of common blues and people saying, "Yeah, I've seen holly blue." Um, so every, every photograph we got was a holly blue, not no random species. But the other thing that makes me fairly confident is if we were getting random common blue records mixed in here, you probably would have seen them in the gap there. Mm -hmm in weeks 24 to 28. Um, that's probably when common blue would be at its peak. And we didn't get any anybody reporting blue butterflies at that period. So I don't, I don't think there was any holly blues around, um, any, any common blues around, sorry, um, that were, com were confusing the results. Uh, so, so we were interested in whether the butterflies had made it across the tier into the, into the and the um, so we were looking at the, at the similar sorts of habitats and we recognised what was the good habitats from Fife and looked at the same habitats around Dundee in the spring. Couldn't find them, so they didn't, didn't seem to have made it that far, not, not quite got across the, the river. But in August, we did start to get the sightings coming in. And because we'd already been looking in the spring and having negatives, it seemed, it seemed like we probably picked up the arrival of the holly blues in the summer in exactly the same sites that we'd looked, checked in the, in the spring. So yeah, it was really interesting to track the spread of holly blues incrementally, kind of day by day, and you could see the very latest edge of the range. Um, which so yeah, we were quite pleased with ourselves that we were managing to track um, track track them as they moved. However, the spanner in the works, we got a record from Aberdeen, uh, <laughs> Liz Chellingsworth. So, so how you know we we were expecting a slow incremental expansion from five. So this, this is a, a map of the records north of the tier, all these, these pink dots here. Um, I was expecting to be able to show you a kind of a nice time lapse showing the spread, so showing the showing the, the butterfly moving across to Dundee and then gradually spreading up the east coast. When I came to actually make this time lapse, I realised that it wasn't quite working out like that. The the earliest records were out to the east, and there was a bit of a pattern here that gradually the records move westward. So it was actually three weeks after a record out to East Haven before we picked them up in Dundee. Um, so so that was a slight puzzle. Um, so combined with the record in Aberdeen, which was nine days after the first arrival north of the Tay, so fully two weeks before they arrived in Dundee. So how could Holly Blues arrive in Aberdeen two weeks before they arrived in Dundee? Um, so that's a bit of a puzzle. Uh, Added to that, there was a record on the Isle of May four days before we, we saw them on the on the, on the north of the tip. So it can't really explain this, but there's something going on, something a bit more going on here than just a slow incremental expansion. Um, it seems to be a much more mobile butterfly than most of the other butterflies in this in this family, and the, the spreading in slightly unpredictable ways. Uh, yeah, so any more data would, would be really useful to try to understand what's going on. Anything that hasn't been submitted from 2023 would be really helpful. We've obviously got small data sets, so anything, anything else you can add would help. Any sightings starting next month would be really useful. Any any sightings in, in April 2024 will probably be a result of colonisation in summer 2023, so it kind of helps us work backwards a little bit. 
2024 plans, we're, we're going to move the Post Guard survey across to Dundee and Angus. So we'll keep up with, as the butterfly moves, we'll keep, we'll, we'll aim to keep our survey moving and gradually increasing the awareness. So we can, we can tell people that they can get excited because of the new butterfly mm -hmm. coming, coming their way, appearing in their gardens. Mm -hmm. I believe eggs were found in Aberdeen at the end of the year. That's right, yeah. yeah. So the butterfly sighting was followed up with eggs and caterpillar sighting it. Um, is anyone here from Aberdeen? Would be <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone would like to chat to us about the survey we did and you know take, have some of the postcards and do a similar thing in Aberdeen, um, we'd be very welcome to, to, to have that input too. Um, okay, finally... Yeah, request if you're recording butterflies, it's really useful if you use iRecord. Um, if you want your records to be visible on, on this kind of project, we're actually tracking things in real time. Um, iRecord is the official system of butterfly conservation. The BNM system is built on top of iRecord. Um, but the thing about iRecord is the, the result that any, anything you input is instantly visible to anybody who wants to see it. Um, so it helps me track what's going on and I can take the latest data, update my maps, Publish the maps on social media and tell everybody, look, something interesting's happening. Go, can you go out? Can you come come and help with us? If you submit your records somewhere else that doesn't where the records aren't public, it could take years before the data becomes appears on a distribution map or something, which obviously is not, not helpful for this, this kind of project. Still worth doing uh, if you need to do that, but it, it's for this kind of project, um, need these other records as, as they happen. Um, I provide Regular updates, almost daily updates on the East Scottish Butterflies Facebook group for anyone who wants to track things in real time. It's a private group, but if you ask Ian Cow nicely, he, he usually lets, lets people in so you can see exactly what's going on. We'll post all the latest news on there. Um, I do do field trips. Got a field trip to see Purple Hair Streak eggs at King Clavin on Good Friday. Um, so there's a field trip set up to, to show Woodland Trust volunteers how to how to find um, Purple Hair Streak eggs. But if anyone's interested in coming along to King Clavin, uh, to see them and feel free. I do travel to do training days for purple hair streaks as well, because as I mentioned, people need to know how to find purple hair streaks. That they're not likely to come across them um, until they know what exactly what the techniques are, when, what time of day to look, and what how to spot them. Usually involves uh, binoculars looking at the tops of the trees. And um, anyone who'd like to just get in touch with me directly, just ask any questions or you know see if I can help out with anything. That my email address is there, so feel free to get in touch. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. I'm very inspiring as always. I keep talking. Yeah, um, it, it's very, very difficult to tell. Obviously, we've had we, we don't really have a baseline and because there's so few records, we don't have a solid baseline. But it's but but once people know what they're doing, it's been so easy to go to areas with well outside the range and find them like you know the d-side record it what that obviously wasn't an incremental expansion that was many many miles outside the known range seemed much more likely that uh that they just hadn't been discovered there um so uh, so that's the main thing that makes me think that it's not it, it would have to be a really really rapid range expansion to account for the change in the number of records you know to go from 27 records to 600 records that's probably not range expansion it's it seems to be uh yeah, well, it could be both, yeah. It could absolutely be both. It could also be just that they're even whether there's a range expansion or not, they just might be more, uh, higher numbers, so just easier to find in places that they already were. So, yeah, we, as ever with these things, it's usually a combination of factors, and it's quite hard to narrow it down just to one simple solution. Um, but my own feeling is it's the the, the the range change on the map is is probably going to be quite misleading next time the butterfly conservation maps come out. It's going to report. You know, fifty percent increase in purple hair street range in Scotland. I'm sure that's not the case. It's just a greatly improved awareness. Uh, sorry, yeah. The, if if you look at the maps, so so, so Hollywood's moved quite quickly uh, northwards. If you look at the maps, you do see you do see that the that the records are following rail lines. Whether whether that's statistically significant or not, um, it's total speculation. But they moved from the south of Fife to the north of Fife very quickly. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, 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 so it's why Wormit? Why did they arrive in Wormit first? Um, so, so did they go all the way around the coast and then round the north coast back up the Tay? If so, why were there not more records in St Andrews and you know, places around the coast? Um, the, the thing, I guess, the thing that made me think about it is from visiting Wormit, you see how much ivy there is along the railway lines. It's everywhere. And it's really solid 
solid ivy. It's the, the best source of ivy around is usually alongside rail lines. So it was purely a very speculative theory, and I definitely wouldn't put too much store into it, but, it, but it's an idea, it's a possibility. If you look at the records north of the Tay as well, they do happen to be going along the railway lines, where that's coincidence because the railway line follows the coast. You know, so maybe it's the coast is the thing, north of the Tay. Um, so I don't know, it's just an idea, and I, I don't suppose we'll ever really know. So. I bet you <laughs> well, well, they arrived in Aberdeen, but they must have got on the train to get from there. <laughs> <Yeah. Vice -tribe. laughs> Great. Thank, Thank you, Chris. Uh, just a very quick uh, plug. Uh, as you'll be aware, uh, Butterfly Conservation has done five-year surveys of the state of butterflies across the whole of the UK since we did the Millennium Atlas. Uh, 2024 is the, the, the last year of the current five-year period, so that's a good time to get, rec uh, get any gaps filled and get your records sent in. Yeah. But more significantly, it's 25 years since the Millennium Atlas was published. And there is a proposal working its way through the system at the moment to produce some kind of atlas to mark that 25 year period. So that's a double reason why 2024 is a particularly good year to get out and fill any gaps that are left and, and fuel the alleged expansion of purple hair streak and and the definite expansion of holly blue in Scotland. And I'm personally very keen that Scotland is well represented because that's the place where all the interesting and exciting things are happening with butterflies and moths, of course, but especially with butterflies. So just a reminder on that, if you've got any gaps to fill, don't leave it till 2025, get them in in 2024 if you can. Thank you very much. Welcome back everybody for our last talk of the day. Uh, Tom Prescott requested dry ice and music for his introduction, but I don't have either of those, so I said no, and here he is. Well, afternoon, everybody. So thanks for, for staying on for the uh, the last session. Um, I always seem to be dragged out for the last session, and I always seem to be talking about the same things. And it's always about trying to get you lot out there to look for some of our rare and threatened species, our priority species. And obviously, I'm not doing it right because you're still all here. I'm still here talking about the same old species. So, um, yes. So what I really want to do is that my job is to infuse you lot so that you go out and help us look for some of these species. We've got various events going on. Um, so some of it's surveys, some of it's recording, some of it's sort of habitat monitoring. Some of it is just getting out there and getting dirty and helping with some of our habitat management work. So it's going to be a bit of a whiz through. At the end, I'll show you our Scottish generic email address. Rather than giving you lots of different people to contact, you can just contact that one email address and then with what, whatever you want to get involved with, and then we can point you to the right person. So are you all ready? Shall we make a start? Come on. Shall we make a start? Yeah. That's... <laughs> yeah, okay, fair point. <laughs> right. Hopefully, most of you know that March is Mossy March for, for the Bog Squad. This is our probably the only thing that we do in BC that is actually carbon negative. We are there trying to restore peatlands to sequester carbon. And it's done by through Polly, running a number of Bog Squad events where you go out, you get nice and mucky, nice and dirty, and on the whole, you are clearing scrub to benefit large heath, um, and other Lepidoptera, as well as just the habitat and store the carbon. So you can see there, there's four events happening all in March in different parts of central Scotland. Now, what are we all doing tomorrow? <laughs> well, you should all be at Westermoss. There's no excuse. It's, you won't forget between now and tomorrow. Turn up at Westermoss, there'll be cake. You can, there, you can go, you can start clearing the scrub to benefit uh, our wonderful reserve there just outside Fallin for large heath and some of the other species that are there. So come on, let, let's go. I think, Polly, there's going to be everybody. I mean, how many folk are in the room? 80 people? You're going to have the biggest uh, work party ever. But so, that, so there's lots to do. So just, just get, get involved. 
However, there is a problem. If we start removing all our scrub, then you know we'll end up with a bit of a monoculture. And what some of our species require, particularly silvery arches, which is one of our high priority species, is uh, young birch, particularly in the spring. That's what the caterpillars are feeding on. But what we really need to know for silvery arches is what is exactly its favoured habitat. What is it just birch? Is it birch and sallow? Do they only feed on the, the, the birch and sallow once it gets to a certain height? Once it's, say, maybe over a metre high? Then uh, they, you know, for whatever reason, a bit like Kentish Glory or Dark Border Beauty caterpillars, you know, once the trees get too mature, then the caterpillars don't feed on the leaves. So uh, we really want you to go and look. We're going to run some events at night because that's the best time to find these caterpillars looking for silvery arches caterpillars. And that will then help inform us how we manage Western moss, because we need to leave some scrub for silvery arches, but how much and what height and what density. So, so that will be really, really useful to help us move this species along its recovery curve, finding out more about that niche. So we'll be advertising events like this. There'll be certainly a nighttime event looking at Western moss. The, the site that David mentioned in his Clearfell talk, uh, he caught good numbers of silvery arches. So again, that's another site where we could go at night if it's safe and look for the caterpillars. Small pearl bordered fritillary. Now, south of the border, this is a very, very rare butterfly, uh, but particularly in central in England or, or the eastern half of England. But in most of Scotland, particularly in sort of from the central belt northwards and in Highland and Argyll, it's really, really common. But it's less so in the borders. So Barry Prater has been uh, organising a survey of small pearl bordered fritillary in the borders. So if you're in the borders, Please go out and look for small pearl bordered fritillary um, in what, June, July? And Barry can provide you with all the, all the details. The rarer of the fritillaries is the pearl bordered fritillary. And this butterfly is really, really in trouble. Um, difficult to tell from the small pearl bordered fritillary. So there, there is a bit of an issue over identification, but you can tell the difference from the underside. The pearl bordered here has a small dot whereas the small pearl has a bigger dot. The pearl has two white cells. The small pearl has half a dozen white cells. There's also more black and more brown. It's just more of a uh, mosaic of different colors on the underside of the small pearl compared to the pearl bordered. So we're running training days to help you identify the between the two um, so that when you do go out, we know that you have found pearl bordered or small pearl bordered. And you can see here, the map on the left shows you the distribution of the butterfly uh, between 1970 and 82. And you can see there that those blue circles are where the butterfly was recorded during that period, but not recorded between 2010 and 2014. So it really has declined, particularly, I mean, look in Wales and uh, parts of southern England. I mean, it really, really has declined. But even, sadly, in Scotland, lots of blue circles on there. We need Chris to get work on this one. We need him to, to get out there and enthuse us to get out and look for it. And you can see here the dramatic declines. The top one is the, is the decline in occurrence. And uh, so that's in terms of 10 kilometer squares. And the bottom graph shows you in the abundance. So that's data derived from transex. So on both measures, this butterfly is in you know, serious trouble. So we need you to get out there and look for it. This is where you would go, lovely south facing slopes. Uh, with bracken, light bracken, on the edge of woods or in glades or under way leaves. And the caterpillars are only feeding on violets. They're using the bracken in the spring to bask as a caterpillar. They're black caterpillars. They heat up, they absorb the heat, and then they feed on the violets. So it's this combination of light bracken and violets. Without the violets, you won't have the butterfly. And it's going to these lovely south facing, warm, sheltered slopes. Obviously, lots of sites you go to, they look good from a distance. But as soon as you get into that bracken, the bracken is so thick that there's going to be no violets underneath. 
So this is something that uh, Anthony's new project in Perthshire is going to do, is trying to get people out to these sites. And then hopefully, if we're successful with some nature restoration funding, we'll be there talking to landowners, trying to get cattle into these sites to break up the bracken and then where the cattle have been uh, standing around and they've been uh, breaking up the vegetation, that's where we hope that the violets will come in. So if you go onto our website, you'll see a map like this. And then if these are all the sites we'd like you to look at, you can zoom into those sites. And if you hit any of the pins, then the site will come up. This is Carbray up near Kyle of Loch Ausch. And you'll see there that it gives you the grid reference of the site. It tells you how many records there were and when it was last recorded. So pearl bordered fertility hasn't been recorded from that site, but almost 10 well 10 years and this is a really really important site where there used to be a butterfly transect so you can zoom in you can look around the whole country and you can see where you want to go and sign up let us know where you're going to go these are the key areas where we'd love you to go where the where the butterflies are particularly under recorded and you can you can see there up at the top we've got two events planned there will be more so on the 10th of May at Loch Catrin, I think Nick Cook is running that, and our very own Anthony on the 20th of May at Duncoilic near Aberfeldy. So chances to get involved. There may also be some online training. So if you can't go to those in-field visits, then uh, we'll be doing some online training. Let's go to Checkered Skipper. Now, you might remember many years ago, we ran a survey for three years trying to encourage you to go out to one kilometre squares that we thought the butterfly should be at due to some modelling, but there'd been no records. And it was phenomenally um, successful. You can see there that, that in over those three years, this butterfly was found in 104 new one kilometre squares. I mean, it was just phenomenal. By telling you exactly where to go within a one kilometre square, it seemed to work. And that increased the range of the butterfly at a one kilometer resolution by 42%. Superb. I mean, that was again, 10 years ago. What have you been doing? Because lots of those sites haven't been revisited. So we produced this map and this shows you all the squares where we would like you to visit. There's a vast number of squares there. So if we take records, the yellow dots or the yellow squares, these are records where the butterfly hasn't been seen since 2015. Uh, so the 279 squares. If we take it back to 2010, um, the, the, so the, the, the yellow squares are all records, whereas the orange squares are where the butterfly, uh, it's, it's, we're only going back to 2010. So it's not been seen since 2015. So lots and lots of sites to go to. Um, and uh, yeah, again, this will all be on the website so you can get involved. While you're out looking for checkered skipper and pearl bordered fertility, often at the same sites, we have this very rare, lovely, but small uh, micro moth. It, uh, it's got a very characteristic flight. It spins around in circles and places like glass drum, you get lots of people um, uh, go to glass drum to look for checkered skipper and are completely unaware that this uh, this lovely little micro moth is there. So we're trying to encourage you to go and look for this moth if you're out there looking for checkered skipper. That's where it occurs. So it's mostly in North Argyle. Um, you see the red squares, the red squares are where there are old records for Anania fenebris, white uh, spotted sable, from uh, well, from the from the Inner Hebrides, but we don't have any exact record. So please get out there. It feeds on goldenrod. Um, so goldenrod, you find it on uh, you know uh, rock ledges, but it's also a woodland plant. You'll find it along the on the edges and on the on the boundaries of, of woodlands. So so please get out and look for it. It's day flying. As I say, if you're if you're at a site where there's checkered skipper, then please look for golden rod, and in the vicinity, please look for this tiny little beautiful micro. Um, so again, we're having a uh, a butterfly and moth day, checkered skipper, pearl bordered, and uh, anania fenebris at Glassdrum in May. Uh, we haven't set the date yet, so yes, please come along to that. Northern Brown Argus. I seem to talk about Northern Brown Argus uh, every time I'm up on this uh, little podium. Uh, lovely northern butterfly with the two white spots. 
Uh, again, a species that's in trouble. Our subspecies that has the white dots on is endemic. It only occurs in Scotland. Um, you can see here some of the, the declines in the UK for distribution. And again, even in Scotland, it's declining. You know, 49% uh, decline in its distribution between 1990 and 2014. I can't give you any figures for its occurrence because we have so few sites which are monitoring the population that we aren't able to, to, to uh, calculate how this butterfly is faring um, in terms of its population. But we can with its distribution and it's, yeah, it's not looking healthy. One of the reasons is a forestation. So uh, Barry Prater, who I mentioned before, who's running the Small Pearl Bordered Fertility Survey, um, in 2016, he started a similar survey for Northern Brown Argus in the Borders. And through that survey, he asked people to go and assess the sites where the butterfly, where they saw the butterfly or where the butterfly used to be. And through that assessment, they found that over 50% of the sites were in poor, that were assessed were in poor condition. And it was mostly due to afforestation. So you can see at bottom left, lots of uh, trees have been planted there. You can see where, again, bottom right, um, you know, the rock rows where the actual trees have been planting amongst. Here is just the cessation of grazing and the rock rose is being outcompeted as the grass gets too tall and gorse and other scrub comes in. So we really need to start rolling this out in Scotland, and we have done that, and it's really just carrying on. More of the same, please. And here are some of the sites where we'd like you to go. So, so a lot of these sites, we know if the butterfly's there or not. This is about going out and seeing if the rock rose is there and trying to determine the habitat, because we really need to know what the condition of these sites are. And if they're in poor condition, then we need to do something about it. We need to go and talk to the landowners, maybe organise uh, work parties. Um, so again, this is all online. And if you want to get involved, then uh, yeah, please just get in touch. So you can see there that uh, in terms of uh, monitoring the, the butter or visiting the sites, so it's, it's amazing that 60% of all the, the Northern Brown Argus sites in Scotland have already been mapped. So there's still 40% to do. So it's, uh, you know, we, we should be out there trying to hit off those, those last 40%. And then these are some of the maps that we can produce. We've got localized maps covering the rest of you know, the whole of Scotland. So I'm just putting this up by way of an example. So if you're interested, you know, whether you're in Perthshire or whether you're in, um, I don't know, Easter Ross or wherever, then we can provide these maps which will help you determine at uh, you know, a more local level where we would like you to, to go and visit. So it can be very, very targeted. And of course, the great thing with Northern Brown Argus is not just going out and looking for the adults. You can go out and find the eggs. You can see the egg there laid on the upper surface of the leaf. It looks like a fun-sized golf ball. When it hatches, it's like a polo. Um, and then in the autumn, after hibernation, the caterpillar comes out and you can just see it here. Uh, and it makes these lovely windows in the uh, in the leaves of the rock row. So there's plenty of opportunity to go out and look for northern brown argus as an adult, mainly in sort of June, July, but then through you know many other attempts you can have through the rest of the year. So we're particularly looking for surveyors in Solway and along the east coast, mainly through our Species on the Edge project, but we've also got to online and field events, and you can see them there. So down in, uh, you know, in the Solway, there's one there in the Solway, you know, Easter Ross, Perthshire and Kukubrishire. So a good mix of sites where we're running events to train you up and to take you out and to show you Northern Brown Argus and to get involved with, uh, with this survey. Small blue, another species that's on the uh, priority under species on the edge. Um, and an online training um, on Thursday the 21st. So that's what, what next week. So again, let us know if you want to come to that online training. We're looking for somebody to continue the Lock Fleet Transit near Dornock. It's been walked for many, many years by Tony Mainwood. Uh, Tony's now unable to do it. So we're really, really looking for somebody locally to carry on with that transect. Also established monitoring nearby at Logie Quarry, where we've been doing a lot of work. 
and also it'll be small blue week will come back round again so the normally the first week of may so again please get involved with small blue and if you want to know more yeah please attend our online training kentish glory what a superb moth again david mentioned this in his talk i mean a fantastic moth probably my uh, favorite moth superb thing um, you can see there it's it's um, only really occurs in the Cairngorms now. Uh, you can see uh, it's in Badenoch and Strathspey and Deeside and Highland Persia. There's a population on the coast at Colbin Forest. It'll be on the wing very soon, uh, middle of April uh, to the end of May. There's its ideal habitat, open birch woodland with uh, short birch trees that are sort of isolated. Uh, the female lays her eggs in batches. They start off yellow, then they go this lovely brown color, so they're very well camouflaged. Once they hatch, it's like fun-sized bubble wrap, as you can see up here. And several years ago, maybe seven, eight years ago, we developed some pheromone lures. So in this uh, netted bag, it's not a bag of garlic, or it used to be a bag of garlic. It's now got a Kentish Glory lure in. And having those lures, lots of people got involved and we found Kentish Glory in lots of new sites. It was rediscovered in uh, Highland Perthshire after an absence of about 10, 10 or 12 years. We are hoping, it is a bit of a hope, that we may have some fresh lures available for this coming season. We placed the order to get the chemical. The guy that developed these lures used to work at the university down in Kent. He's now living in Perthshire. He's working at the UHI, um, you know, locally in Perth. The problem is he hasn't got a lab to make up the uh, the lures. So we're trying to work with him. We hope that we've we've uh, say can get this chemical in time, and he will then make up a fresh batch of lures. So this one is a bit. Watch this space. We're hopeful that we'll have lures this spring, so that you can go out and record this amazing moth. Um, you know, mainly in the Cairngorms and in um, Colbin. But the other thing we really want you to do is to actually go out and find the early stages. Finding the adults is superb. They're fantastic. But we really need to know where these moths are, are breeding. So we want you to go out and look for the eggs and also look for the caterpillars. The caterpillars live together for the first two instars, first three instars all together, and they then make very distinctive localized feeding damage. They feed on the leaves, but they leave the stalks behind. So you can go and look on a young birch tree, you can see where there's localized defoliation, and hopefully see that the leaves have been eaten, but not the stalks, and then hunt around and either find the, the, the mature caterpillars or the bigger caterpillars, they get bigger and greener than this, but also look for the uh, fun-sized bubble wrap, the old egg batch. So it's really important that A, that we put Entish Glory back on the map, but more importantly, we identify where it's breeding because they're the sites that probably need to be managed. So that's Kentish Glory. Small dark yellow underwing, another scarce moth that's more or less just um, uh, distributed in the uh, in the Cairngorms. It's a day flying moth. It's associated with bearberry. So bearberry often grow. Oh, sorry, bearberry often grows in uh, on open moorland, dry moorland, often heather moorland where the, the where the heather has been burnt in uh, bare areas where there's bits of erosion on banks and things. And as uh, Epiphany mentioned this morning, we've got funding through RWE to work on a um, wind farm site up near Evanton. And what we're trying to do is to try and establish Bearbury along the track sides of this, um, of, of all the track sides of this, this big wind farm. Uh, but we don't quite know how to grow Bearbury. So we're going to be experimenting, trying to grow it from the berries, trying to take cuttings, uh, but also do surveys for the moth and not just use the money just at this one site. We also want to be looking for the for the moth, um, you know, throughout its range. And one of the things with uh, small dark yellow underwing, we've only ever once found the caterpillars in the wild. And that was using a bug vac, which is like a reverse of a leaf blower on, when it was on a petrol engine. It was very, very heavy. But what we want to do now is to go out and find and look for the caterpillars using the array of cordless um, 
Hoovers that you can get. So we might be going out there with Henry or with Black and Decker or Ryobi or Dyson. So we're going to try and experiment going out to different sites to use these to try and soak up the larvae of small dark yellow undoing. Um, so that that's our challenge. Um, and we're hoping we might offer this as a student project as well. So it'd be quite bizarre, you know, going out on a upper Munro, somebody in uh, upper Munro, and finding somebody in front of you carrying a, a cordless Henry. So um, watch this space. And there's there's two other rare species that are associated with Bearberry: netted mountain moth and uh, a wee Coleophora Coleophora arctostaphyli. Now, heath rivulet. So part of BC's current strategy is that we've got 71 high priority species. Most of the ones are the ones I've mentioned are all priorities and the burnets that Liz was talking about and marsh fertility. Well, this is another of those priority species. And to be honest, we've done next to nothing on it in Scotland because we think it's fairly widespread. And also we don't quite know what we should be doing on it. But having spoken with colleagues in England, I hadn't quite fully realised how scarce heath rivulet is in England. So Scotland probably has about 90% of the population. So if we're going to do anything for heath rivulet, we really need to start doing it in Scotland. And the first thing to do is to really put it on the map and see whether we can find out a little bit about the, the niche, the habitat niche that it's in. So you can see here the, the distribution map. So it's in sort of you know the central highlands. Um, a few sites sort of further north in Easter Ross. And the key thing is that it feeds on eyebright as a caterpillar, but it's feeding in the flowers and then in the developing seeds. It's day flying. It's a very, very small moth. Whenever I've caught it, I've only ever caught it by sweeping. And often when you sweep a moth and you catch it in your net, you think, oh, well, it's so small. It's not going to be a macro moth. It's going to be, you know, a micro or, or whatever. But uh, it, it is a very, very small but very brightly colored moth. So we want you really to go out into some of these areas, some of these sort of slightly more remote upland areas where there's eye bright probably along the paths and see whether you can uh, find this moth. It's on the wing in what, July, early August, and then perhaps we need to go back and start looking for the caterpillars um, later in the summer, September, October. So that's Heath Rivulet. It's a fairly similar story for yellow ring carpet. Again, um, one of our priority species, a species that we've done next to nothing about in Scotland, a species that's very, very scarce in the, in the north of England. Um, you can see here, it's got, again, it's got that sort of central uh, Scotland or central Highland uh, distribution. A few more records out on the West Coast on some of the islands, uh, you know, right up the West Coast, right up to, to Sutherland. And it feeds primarily, certainly in the central area, on uh, yellow mountain saxifrage. Again, the caterpillars, like Heath, Heath Rivulet, are feeding on the flowers. Um, one issue with yellow ring carpet is trying to distinguish it from um, grey mountain carpet. But if you go out early in the season and you get nice fresh individuals, then the yellow ring carpets will have nice yellow or golden sort of flecks on their on their wings. It also has it behaves slightly differently. So we think that in the West Coast, it is double brooded. You can see there the two peaks, you know, a peak in end of May, June. And a, and a second peak in August, September, whereas in the Central Highlands, it's more of a, a on the wing, perhaps, you know, June, July. Or in southwest Scotland, who knows, it may be double brooded, but there's so few records, it's difficult to tell, which again makes it a little bit tricky to know when to go out and look for it and when to look for the, uh, look for the, um, the caterpillars. So it's really just alerting to you this to the you about this wonderful moth. So if you're in areas where you're seeing, um, you know, yellow uh, mountain saxifrage or other saxifrages, then, um, you know, go back and look at the right time of year, whenever that might be, either for the adults or for the caterpillars. And this is just a, 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 well, a mixed slide, really, to show you some of the other species that we're interested in. So if we start top left, the good old Tyree twist, only occurs at a single site on Tyree. If anybody's going to Tyree this year on holiday, then please look out for the moth. We are vaguely hopeful that we may have, have found the caterpillars for the very first time last year. It's the, the, the caterpillars that we've got in captivity have pupated. 
So hopefully in the next couple of months, we will know whether they emerge as the Tyree twist. I probably st stood here and said exactly the same thing, uh, what, two years ago, three years ago, and those caterpillars turned out to be something else. So, uh, but we're hopeful this time, but yeah, we're always hopeful. So yes, if you're going to Tyree, please let us know. Um, we've bought lures for the clearings. There's two clearings there, Welsh clearing and large red belted clearing. Again, we'll run training days and field events. There's also white barred clearing we want you to look for. For lead, large red belted clearing, I suspect it's probably fairly widespread in Scotland. It's in uh, on birch. Um, wherever people seem to go with the lures, it seems to turn up. So we're going to organise a sort of a 10 kilometre survey. So we'll have maps uh, with 10 kilometres where we would like you to go. Again, it's in Highland Perthshire. So this will be one of uh, Anthony's uh, species he'll be looking at. And Portland moth, which is a sand dune species. It's along the Murray coast. Uh, we found it at a few sites as an adult, but we really need to go and look for the caterpillars. Again, it's going at night primarily or it's going during the day and looking for little mole hills in the sand, underneath which we hope would be a little caterpillar. Uh, the books all say it feeds on creeping willow, but some of the sites where we found it, uh, there's no creeping willow, so it must be feeding on other sand dune sites. So we, we've got, uh, we're planning to go to Tensmuir to look for the adults and look for the caterpillars. Go, uh, I know that Ian Leach is off to Tors Warren down in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, we'll be going to Fort George and Tain Rifle Range. Um, so we'll be going in, what, to April, May to look for the caterpillars and then July, August to look for the adults. So again, if you want to get involved with any of that, then yeah, just let us know. And uh, finishing on a, uh, on a micro, this micro Lampronia capitella, the current shoot borer, only occurs at one site in Scotland. It feeds on uh, gooseberries and, and um, uh, black currants. And this, uh, oh, well, as soon as the leaves, very shortly, once the leaves are out, this is what you're looking for. The, here you see some wilted shoots and those shoots have wilted because of the caterpillar of this uh, shoot borer as doing what the name suggests. So the only site we know about in Scotland is near Peebles, near Eshel's Waterworks. Um, so we think there may be some association with currents that are close to rivers. Maybe that damper environment is what they like. So we've produced a map that sort of shows some target sites where we'd like you to go and look and look for this damage, probably, as I say, probably in the next month, once those leaves are out and you see it wilting. There's also another... Well, a wide, what, was, what was formerly a widespread species, the V-moth that feeds on gooseberries and black currants and red currants. This moth has declined by 99% in Britain. So it tends to still hang on at sites where there's old currants. So um, again, something to look out for. So that that moth is probably on the wing in July. So again, if you look online, uh, Reuben Singleton, has done an amazing uh, online talk that we have recorded all about uh, Lampronia capitella. So that that's online, and you can find out all about the about the moth there and what it does, and some superb photos and what we want you to do. And finally, here's a bit of a quiz: What have these two areas got in common? Yes, well done. Somebody's not. Somebody's still awake. They're both in Scotland. So we have Caithness at the top. And we have Dumbartonshire at the south. They are both lacking a moth recorder. Oh. So we are looking for a Vice County moth recorder for Caithness. There can't be many records. I mean, there can't be many moths, can there, that far north? Um, and also we're looking for a moth recorder and a butterfly recorder for Dunbartonshire. So please, if you want to throw your hat in the ring, we will gratefully accept it. So please, uh, yeah, let us know if you want to take that on. That would be wonderful. And that will then give us our full complement of recorders throughout the country. Finally, quick plug for Big Butterfly Count. This is us, uh, you know, testing the pulse of the nation um, for three weeks. So this coming year, you can see the dates there when it's on. If you want to know more about butterflies, then Anthony's running a recording day or an ID day at the Botanics in St. Andrews on the 4th of April. So please go along. Um, if you want to know more about our events, 
uh, well, there's different ways of doing it, but if you go into the, the our website and put events, slash events, or on the main menu, you can see events. Here it says search by branch. If you put Scotland in there and hit search, any event, so whether it's a talk, whether it's a field trip, whether it's a work party, will then be listed. So it's very, very easy to find out what's, uh, what's happening in Scotland simply by going onto the, onto the website. Uh, also, there's been some mention of Assemble today. This is our new volunteer portal. Again, there's more information about it on the web, but if you, as soon as you sign up for that, you will then start getting information directly about all our events. So again, whether they're surveys, whether they are um, work parties, uh, or whether they're talks. So please sign up to Assemble. Um, because if you sign up to Assemble, it means then you're covered through all our health and safety and our insurance whenever you go out and attend any of our events. Also, oh, wrong one, sorry. Also, the uh, e-news. We put out a quarterly e-news, or Polly puts out a quarterly e-news. It's got all our events. It's got reports on what we've been up to. So any gossip, it's all on our e-news. So the next one's due to go out, what, the middle of April? So please make sure you're signed up for that. That's the, probably the best thing to do in terms of what's happening. Um, also, if you want to any more information about anything I've blethered on about, then there's our generic Scottish email address. If you ping an email to that address, then it will be sent to, to the team and uh, we'll fight over who responds. So uh, hopefully that was a very quick whiz. Uh, lots and lots and lots of things for you to do, including tomorrow, joining uh, Holly, who's going to have to get more cake for uh, Wester Moss. Um, so plenty to be getting on with. So uh, thank you. We are now at the end of our programme, and I hope you will agree. It has been a fascinating and inspiring day with lots of great discussion around our plans for this spring and summer. We had a really interesting morning hearing about butterfly research and a thought-provoking theme around commercial forestry and clear fell sites that I don't think we've ever featured before at one of our gatherings. In the afternoon, we moved on to showcasing some of our fantastic engagement work. I'm sure that most of you will have a garden at home, so I do expect to see 130 new wild spaces popping up on the map this <laughs> evening. Uh, please don't forget to register yours or get in touch if you would like help with making one or perhaps taking on a holiday square or going on a trip to Mull to attend one of Liz's art workshops is more your thing. We'll be sending out a summary of all of the opportunities you've heard about today, along with contact details and a recording of the event for those who couldn't make it. I would like to say a huge thank you to everybody attending today, whether in person or online. The turnout has been fantastic, um, and the atmosphere has been amazing too. It's always so positive to see lots of new faces at these events. I've said it already, but I'll say it again. We couldn't do a fraction of all the work you've heard about today without your dedication and hard work. So well done to all of you. Special thanks go to our wonderful speakers. And of course, our staff members, particularly Anthony, who works hard behind the scenes to keep everything running. Final thanks to the library staff for hosting us and making us feel welcome. So all that's left for me to say is I hope you have a very positive start to the season, a safe journey home, and I very much look forward to hearing about all of your antics at our autumn gathering. Thank you very much for attending.